In the fall of 2003, it unleashed an eruption of energy equal to 200 billion hydrogen bombs. Blasting a tidal wave of superheated charged particles at speeds of up to 6 million miles an hour. It was one of the largest solar storms ever recorded. And it was aimed at Earth. They were some of the fastest, hottest, and strongest storms ever measured. Assaulting the Earth, the sun's energy forced space station astronauts to take cover in their most sheltered compartments. Lights went out, communication streams were cut, airliners scrambled for safety. This really was a hurricane of space storms. Though no major damage was done, these storms were a stark reminder that we live at the constant mercy of the sun. It controls all aspects of our lives, our climate, our food, our bodies. We actually live inside the sun's atmosphere. We, along with all the other planets, are greatly influenced but is its influence changing? It's actually growing more powerful. Might we lose its protection from deadly cosmic rays? At its boundary, where it's protecting us from the intergalactic winds, that boundary is actually shrinking a bit. Will our technology-dependent society be able to handle another solar superstorm? Sometimes these effects can be so severe that they're catastrophic. And when will the next superstorm strike? One. Go for drop. Pegasus is away on the IVEX mission. Fall 2008. Stage one ignition. NASA launches IVEX, the Interstellar Boundary Explorer. Part of its mission is to study the effects the sun has on the furthest reaches of our solar system. IBEX joins the long list of human attempts to explain our star's impact on our solar system, our planet, and our lives. The sun. The sun provides all of our light and heat. If it weren't for the sun, we wouldn't be alive. We people are very interested in what goes around us. We like to understand our neighborhood. The sun in the universe is our street, our neighborhood. The sun. We are actually affected by its moods. In fact, it's like the parent and all the planets are the children that are affected by its moods. We need to know how it's going to evolve and how the changes that are always happening in the sun affect us here on Earth. The sun, if we want to understand the universe and the stars that make up the universe, then it's important to study the one that's closest to us. We've learned more about the sun in the past 40 or 50 years than in all of recorded history. This golden age of exploration was kicked off by a unique mission that gave us close-up images of our sun from above our atmosphere. Skylab, we're reading you loud and clear over the Vanguard for eight minutes. In 1973, Skylab became the first manned space station. It sent back images of the sun, clearer than anything taken from Earth. The Skylab mission was one of the very first laboratories that was dedicated just for the research and study of the sun. In some ways, it's kind of the grandfather of the, the current missions today. Right now, a fleet of about 20 space probes scan and study the sun in ways we never imagined, even 30 years ago. By studying the sun from the vantage of space, we can see it in a whole new light, using different light wavelengths, including X-ray and extreme ultraviolet. We can peel back its layers and begin to understand how and why the sun acts the way it does. The different wavelengths mean different temperatures, and different structures are more visible in different wavelengths than in others. Our robotic space probes never stop watching the sun. With their help, scientists are working out the big questions about our star, and we already know a lot. The sun is one of over 200 billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy, but it is our closest at 93 million miles away from Earth almost the same distance as 4,000 trips around the globe. And despite that distance, its light only takes eight minutes to reach Earth. It is only four and a half billion years into its nearly 10 to 11 billion year lifespan. And though technically a medium-sized star called a dwarf, it is enormous, 900,000 miles across. And if hollowed out, 1.3 million Earth-sized planets could fit inside. The sun accounts for 99.8% of the mass in the solar system. 
and it weighs 300,000 times more than the Earth. It is made up almost entirely of a superheated form of electrified and magnetized gas called plasma. The sun packs enough gravitational pull to keep the planets from spinning off into space. And as Copernicus first suggested, it rules the center of our solar system with a gravitational iron fist. Copernicus's model in which he placed the sun in the middle of the solar system with all the planets going around it instead of everything going around the Earth was a giant paradigm shift. It meant that the sun is the most important thing in the solar system. It meant that we really should understand the sun. Our sun, like all other stars in the universe, is made from the dust of stars that lived and died over billions of years, going all the way back to the Big Bang. So our sun and our solar system is really the debris from many generations of stars. The sun we see every day is the solar system's source of power. Deep in the center of our star, its core is superheated to 27 million degrees Fahrenheit and is the engine that drives it all. Inside the sun's core, the process of fusion is occurring, and that fusion process is giving off light and particles. Every second the sun shines, it releases the same amount of energy as one million H-bombs. The sun's light is made of particles called photons, born in the core, then propelled by convection currents through the radiative and convective zones of the sun. Eventually, they reach the volatile outer layers of our nearest star. The sun's outer parts consist of three regions. There's the photosphere, or surface of the sun, and it's not really a hard surface like that of the Earth. The sun is gaseous throughout. And the temperature of the photosphere is around 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Above the thin layer of the photosphere is another thin layer called the chromosphere. And the chromosphere is slightly hotter than the photosphere, which is counterintuitive because you would think that as you go away from the source of all the energy and heat, the core, that temperature would drop. But in fact, the temperature rises from the photosphere to the chromosphere. And it gets even hotter as you rise to the third layer of the atmosphere called the corona. And then beyond the chromosphere is a large, tenuous, extended region, the corona, which is millions of degrees. The sun produces a continuous outward flow of energy called the solar wind. Constantly blowing, it carries energy out into the solar system, extending our sun's reach 9.3 trillion miles, well beyond Pluto. The space in between the planets and the space in the entire solar system is not an empty void but it's full of these particles and it's full of these rays of light. While the solar wind blows away from the sun, its gravity holds and pulls everything in. Take comets. All comets orbit the sun and can get pulled directly into the line of fire. Recently, scientists witnessed one of the sun's most dramatic outbursts, a coronal mass ejection ripping the tail off a comet. When it hit the comet, the tail was cut off like you took a knife, and the tail drifted away. And then it took a little more time for the comet to generate more gas and plasma and dust and create a tail. It tells us about how the solar wind moves in the solar system and how it can affect things. The sun affects everything it touches, even us. To learn just how much, scientists sometimes rely on a remarkable cosmic coincidence. The lethal output of the sun has made studying it almost as difficult as understanding it. But scientists can get a good look at our nearest star thanks to a cosmic coincidence. A total eclipse of the sun. A total solar eclipse occurs when, from our perspective, the moon is exactly aligned with the sun and blocks its photosphere. It's a glorious sight. The solar eclipse is the most wonderful thing to see. It grows really dark by factors of thousands within seconds. And as it does become so dark, you can look up in the sky, you see the dark shadow coming from one direction, sweeping at you. It's really coming at thousands of miles an hour. So it's very impressive to see. Humankind has marveled at the mysteries of the eclipse for millennia. Scientists have used it as an opportunity to see the sun's outer atmosphere, the enigmatic corona. One of the hottest regions of the sun, 
energy from the corona radiates out to the edge of the solar system. The entire solar system actually sits in this outer corona of the sun. So this atmosphere of the sun is bathing all the planets. The engineers who built the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, or SOHO, installed an artificial eclipse into the space probe. Called a coronagraph, it does the same thing as a natural eclipse, blocking out the blinding rays of the sun, so scientists can try and answer an old question. How does the solar corona get so hot? After all, the everyday surface of the sun, the photosphere, is only around 10,000 or a little more Fahrenheit. And the corona, on the other hand, is millions of degrees hot. If you go away from a stove, you know it gets cooler. But if you go away from the everyday surface of the sun, it gets hotter. And how is that? It all starts at the sun's core, where every second, nearly 700 million tons of the universe's most common element, hydrogen, are converted into helium through nuclear fusion giving off the energy that becomes photons, otherwise known as light. The sun's core is really hot, several tens of millions of degrees. And there, the temperatures are so high that protons, hydrogen nuclei, can come together, grab each other, fuse eventually into helium, and in this way, release energy. What happens with these photons, they go through this process, what we call a random walk, where they have to go through the layer of the sun, they get absorbed and then reabsorbed into lots of different photons at lower energy level. So this process of being absorbed and reabsorbed millions of times can take 150,000 years. Once out of the sun's interior, photons are only eight minutes away from Earth, but they're leaving behind a world in constant motion. The solar surface boils. Energy rises constantly from below. Coils of plasma and energy called coronal loops spring across the sun. While dark regions known as sunspots stretch thousands of miles, and at only 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit, these sunspots are the coolest part of the sun, emitting less light than the surrounding area. If you were to pluck a sunspot away from the sun and place it in the sky, it would actually be as bright as the full moon. Sunspots appear on the surface and are easy to see. Their genesis, however, is tied to the sun's deep interior and complex rotation. The sun doesn't rotate like a solid body. Instead, it rotates more quickly near the equator than near the poles, which leads to sunspots. The equator completes one rotation in 25 days. Mid-latitudes complete one rotation in about 30 days. And near the poles, one rotation is completed in about 35 days. Called differential rotation, this process makes the sun's interior churn at different speeds, creating intense magnetism in the form of millions of magnetic field lines, which get mixed up as the sun's interior twists up like a rubber band. This builds up pressure, which makes them buoyant. So they float to the surface, and where they pop through the surface, they create sunspots. Once on the surface, the now twisted and balled up magnetic field lines block the convection of super hot plasma from rising, making sunspots appear dark. And when those sunspots start to twist around, you can imagine that you have one sunspot here and one sunspot here, and there's a, a magnetic field that connects the two. And that magnetic field gets twisted, and eventually the same sort of thing that happens with a rubber band, it pops. And when the magnetic field pops, it releases energy. And in the case of the sun and solar flares, it releases huge, huge amounts of energy. The magnetic field lines created by the twisting and churning of sunspots, though invisible, can be seen in the dramatic formations on the surface of the sun in the form of flares and prominences. It is here that the sun's influence starts as the breaking of these magnetic field lines drives massive amounts of energy from our nearest star out into the solar system. And it is these magnetic field lines that are behind most theories on why the corona is so much hotter than the surface. It's pretty clear that it has something to do with the magnetic field that heats the corona. But presumably there are waves along the magnetic field that bring energy from underneath the surface of the sun into the corona. The solar probe Hinode, which means sunrise in Japanese, was launched in 2006. Its mission to study the interaction between magnetic field lines and the corona, 
Recently, it captured images of one of the waves thought responsible for heating this enigmatic region, Alfvén waves. Alfvén waves are waves that occur in a plasma, in a bunch of ionized gas, threaded by a magnetic field. And indeed, it's thought that these Alfvén waves might be bringing turbulent energy from inside the sun out to the corona, where that energy heats the corona. Energetic Alfvén waves form inside the sun and travel up through the surface, making the looping magnetic field lines sway and vibrate. And so through this vibration or this oscillation, they're having friction with the, the magnetized plasma surrounding it in the corona. And through this friction, the heating occurs. It's this heat delivered to the corona that radiates out into space, filling our solar system with the sun's energy. But this energy is not constant. Our sun is an ephemeral body never the same from one day or one year to the next. Like Earth changes with seasons, so does the sun. And when the solar seasons change, anything can happen. Day in and day out, the sun we see appears the same. But like Earth, the sun has seasons, solar minimum and solar maximum, two distinct personalities that can affect our technology and possibly even our weather. The transition between solar minimums is called the solar cycle, an average 11-year period in which the sun's activity maxes out, then ebbs again. The primary measure of the solar activity cycle is the number of sunspots visible on the sun. During solar minimum, the period with the fewest sunspots, solar activity is limited. When sunspots break through the surface during solar max, the sun's power reaches out. When there are lots of sunspots, there are lots of flares and coronal mass ejections. Increases in solar activity enhance the connection between sun and earth. Energy expelled from the sun can create disturbances in the near-earth environment. The Earth is embedded in the solar atmosphere, and so what happens on the sun affects the Earth. And that's what we call space weather. Accurate space weather forecasting is the ultimate goal, but this can be hard. The sun is turbulent, especially during solar maximum, the peak of solar storm activity. During solar maximum, the magnetic field of the corona becomes very complicated, and you have magnetic fields everywhere, all around, even near the poles. You can have coronal mass ejections and flares and solar storms occurring sometimes several times a day. Solar flares, violent eruptions of energy, usually near sunspots, burst into space. Like a bolt of lightning, quick and powerful, they can happen over a matter of minutes and can give off the same amount of energy as a billion megatons of dynamite. Solar flares are gigantic outbursts of energy from the sun coming from a very small localized region of the sun's surface. So they're very concentrated ejections of energy that heat the surrounding gas to 10 million degrees. Solar flare is sort of like a snapping of the whip. It really releases a lot of energy very quickly, accelerating particles almost up to the speed of light. The particles from the very most energetic solar flares can reach us in something like 15 minutes. But the solar hurricane of space weather comes from coronal mass ejections. These massive blasts carry billions of tons of superheated gas and plasma into interstellar space. So a coronal mass ejection is where a, a huge amount of mass and energy is expelled away from the solar surface. So if you can imagine this huge amount of mass and energy traveling away from the sun at these large speeds, sometimes at over a million miles an hour. They throw these like big bubbles of hot gas and magnetic field. It can move off the sun so quickly that it actually creates a shock wave. They're the biggest storms, and they're the important ones for understanding space weather. Solar probes, like SOHO, have captured the sun, expelling massive amounts of energy into space. But scientists are most concerned when they see something called the halo effect, when the cloud of energy appears to surround the coronagraph. That means the sun has aimed its latest blast at us, like in the massive solar storms of 2003. The fastest coronal mass ejection ever studied in modern times came from these storms. Shortly after the initial blast from the sun, SOHO was bombarded by charged solar particles, protons and electrons, overwhelming the camera. 
and causing the image to drop out. What happens is you see a sort of snow on the camera, all sorts of sparkles going by. And that's the particles accelerated by the coronal mass ejection hitting the actual camera on SOHO. If caught off guard, solar storms can harm astronauts, exposing them to the same amount of radiation in seconds that we receive on Earth in a year. So if we're going to send astronauts back to the moon and to Mars, it becomes very important to be able to determine when these coronal mass ejections and storms are going to occur. The charged particles embedded in these coronal mass ejections are dangerous. It's a lot of radiation that would hit an astronaut. Astronauts and satellites aren't the only potential victims of solar storms. The particles blasted towards Earth can interact with our magnetic field, occasionally wreaking havoc. When this material comes smashing into the Earth's magnetic field, it causes it to ring almost like a bell. And when you have a magnetic field and when that magnetic field moves, physics tells us it's going to create currents. And so electrical currents will be created in the, the outer atmosphere of the Earth. And these electrical currents can cause all sorts of disturbances. The currents create problems for satellites orbiting the Earth. They disrupt global positioning systems. They can interfere with communications equipment, causing radio blackouts and knocking out mobile phone systems. These mass ejections can send so many charged particles toward the Earth that some of them make it through the Earth's magnetic field and even reach power stations here on Earth causing surges of, of electrons and, and power outages and short circuits and things like that. In extreme situations, solar storms cause excessive radio interference and increased levels of radiation, requiring planes flying near the poles to be rerouted. But as powerful as the storms were in 2003, they're no match for what astronomer Richard Carrington saw in 1859, a super flare. The super flare of 1859 was incredible because prior to this event, we didn't even know that flares existed. Carrington saw this huge bright flash on the sun with an unaided eye. And in order for him to see that, it had to have been a super huge, huge flare. There were reports of telegraph lines running uh, without being powered. We probably won't see another one that intense in our lifetime. Although it's hard to say for sure. The sun has thrown us some surprises. If a similar storm were to strike today, one recent estimate projects 130 million people would lose power, possibly for months. Most of the electrical infrastructure, the power grids around the world would be knocked out. A lot of the transformers would be overloaded. Having the a large portion of the population with no power for, for many, many months could cost huge amounts of money. People have estimated that it would be upwards of two trillion dollars. We won't know unless it actually happens, and the more warning we get, the more we can do to reduce the economic impact, which is one of the reasons why we're studying the sun. Scientists are a step closer to being able to predict these storms since the launch of the Solar Terrestrial Relations Observatory, also known as STEREO. This pair of probes now gives scientists the ability to see the sun in 3D. So now, when one of these coronal mass ejections travels towards us, we're actually looking at the side view. And so we can see how fast they're traveling, we can see how they're evolving, the structure. In 2011, the stereo probes will reach their ideal vantage point, opposite sides of the sun, giving NASA a 360 degree view, allowing them to see what is coming from the far side of the sun before it impacts Earth. And so for the first time, we're going to have a complete view of the sun all the way around. So this is going to allow us to see everything that's happening on the sun at the same time. And this will lead us again into a better ability to predict these types of storms. But as dangerous as solar maximum can be for its increase in space weather, the sun's solar cycle counterpart and calmer period, solar minimum, may come with its own dangers. When there are a low number of sunspots on the sun, the climate here on Earth can actually cool a little bit. 2008 saw the fewest number of sunspots in nearly a century, with a total of 266 sunspot-free days. In 2008, we were at sunspot minimum, but by now we expect it to be climbing out of that sunspot minimum, and we're not. So this could mean that this particular sunspot minimum is more protracted. 
scientists believe that past protracted minimums have had a chilling impact here on Earth. Now, every once in a while, the sunspot activity cycle seems to just go away or become much diminished. There was such a period around 1650 to the early 1700s. There were only about 50 sunspots recorded when normally in the same time frame there are tens of thousands. So it was a really low, low uh, period of, of sunspots. It was called the Maunder Minimum. The sun was in a quiet state. And that was associated with lower than normal temperatures here on Earth. Europe experienced sort of a mini ice age during those few decades. Whether or not this current minimum will be protracted enough to have such a large impact on Earth won't be known for years. But another measure of solar activity, the solar wind, appears to be waning. And that could impact Earth tomorrow. Bathed in the sun's atmosphere, Earth is shielded from deadly cosmic rays. And while the sun's power protects us, it can also harm us. Life on Earth survives this close to its star, thanks in part to its ozone layer. But what would happen if the ozone layer were gone? If Earth lost much of its ozone layer, ultraviolet radiation from the sun would penetrate through the atmosphere and reach the Earth's surface. The sun's massive amounts of ultraviolet rays would quickly eliminate most basic elements of the food chain, wiping out plants and then animals. If we are bathed in huge amounts of ultraviolet light, eventually the life on the Earth would die. But what could cause such a catastrophic collapse of the ozone layer? Something the sun is supposed to protect us from, a gamma ray burst. Gamma ray bursts are intense, brief flashes of the most energetic kind of radiation known, gamma rays. The most powerful events in the universe, in seconds, they give off the same amount of energy that the sun will emit in its entire life. They occur when certain large mass stars die or even collide. They can be generated from very um, extreme processes, such as large mass stars collapsing into black holes. They occur somewhere in the sky, roughly once per day, and they come from very, very far away. Most of them are billions of light years away. But just 8,000 light years away, deep within the Sagittarius constellation, buried in a pinwheel-like formation, looms a potentially ticking time bomb. WR-104, two stars locked in a cosmic dance, spinning a full rotation once every eight months. But one of these stars is on the verge of going supernova and emitting a gamma ray burst. Now, one of these two stars is a very massive star that might someday form a gamma ray burst. And its beam might hit the Earth. If the high energy beam from a gamma ray burst were pointing directly at the Earth, it could spell real danger. The radiation from the gamma ray burst would be so intense, very short, on the order of 10, 20 seconds. But this would set up a, a chain of events which eventually would deplete the Earth of maybe 50 or more percent of the ozone layer. Scientists have speculated that a nearby gamma ray burst caused an ancient extinction on Earth millions of years ago. At the time, there was only sea life that, was ex that existed. And even though the sea life deep beneath the sea wouldn't be directly affected by the UV radiation, the plankton and the life on near the surface would die off, and therefore the food chain would be affected. The threat is heightened even further by something scientists have witnessed over the past few decades. A 20% decrease in the power of the sun's solar winds. The solar wind is the steady emission of particles from the sun. They carry the magnetic field that is in the solar corona out into space. It exists even when there are no coronal mass ejections or solar flares. The solar wind continues way out beyond the orbit of Pluto and has actually blown a bubble in interstellar space. Now that's a bit of a protective bubble because the magnetic fields protect us from charged particles coming from outside. Normally, solar winds stream off the sun in all directions at speeds of one million miles per hour. Pulling the sun's invisible magnetic field along with it, they form the solar system's defense against intergalactic intrusion, the heliosphere. The heliosphere is the very boundary where the solar wind hits intergalactic space. 
So it's this shell that's surrounding the sun and the solar system where it protects us from intergalactic winds here on Earth. Recently, scientists have learned that the heliosphere is shrinking and getting weaker. The solar wind pressure has been measured to be decreasing over the last 25 years. In fact, the heliosphere where the solar wind pressure is, is extending out to has actually shrunk a bit. A weaker heliosphere increases the possibility that Earth will be exposed to harm from intergalactic cosmic materials. So if there's less solar wind, then the heliosphere itself is going to shrink. That makes it easier for more cosmic rays to enter into the solar system. Already, the amount of high-energy electrons, a small but telling aspect of cosmic rays around Earth, has jumped in number by 20%. Looks like the cosmic ray electrons have increased, and you would expect that if the solar wind has decreased by 20, 30% over the last 15 years, the bubble will have gotten smaller, and you expect an increase in galactic cosmic rays. The good thing for us is that we live on a planet with a thick atmosphere and a magnetic field. So we have two types of shields that protect us. But that could change when WR-104 emits its gamma ray burst, possibly upsetting the balance of Sun and Earth, a balance that may already be in jeopardy because of something the Sun did billions of years ago. Over billions of years, the Sun and the Earth have developed the perfect balance for life to thrive. Sitting in the Goldilocks position of the solar system, not too hot and not too cold, the Sun gives us just enough light, just enough heat, and just enough energy to fuel our planet and our lives. The Sun drives everything on the Earth. The Sun is the energy source of the Earth. So all of the energy that's given off by the Sun heats up the Earth, this drives weather uh, on a larger time scale, this drives climate. Uh, and so the inner, basically the sun is the energy source, it's the battery that drives the whole Earth environment. Plants harness the sun's energy through photosynthesis, creating carbohydrates. People and animals consume these carbohydrates, converting them into energy we can use. Even the fossil fuels that power our lives were created by the sun. But our increased use of fossil fuels seems to be upsetting the balance between the sun and the earth. Since all living material gets its energy initially from the sun, the sun is the source of the fossil fuels, whether it's trees, whether it's other things that have been trapped in the rock layer and then squeezed and slowly over millions of years made into the hydrocarbons that we know them as. And we then harvest and use those from underground. The fossil fuels that we burn today unleash the sun's energy from millions of years ago, overwhelming the balance struck between our planet and its nearest star. If we burn all this, we will change the atmosphere unrecognizably long before we get to a point when we're actually running out of the resource itself. Already, we have seen the effects of too much solar energy in the rise of global temperatures. The release of millions of tons of ancient solar energy stored in fossil fuels has amplified the necessary and natural process called the greenhouse effect. Many people think that the greenhouse effect is a bad thing. Well, in fact, it's not. It keeps the Earth warm. Without the greenhouse effect, Earth's oceans would be frozen solid. What is bad is too much of a greenhouse effect. If there's too much carbon dioxide and water vapor and methane in the Earth's atmosphere, then those gases trap too much of the sun's radiation, elevating Earth's average temperature, leading to global warming. Now that can cause a melting of the polar caps and a rise in the ocean levels, leading to just a calamity on Earth if it happens too quickly. Not only will our atmosphere continue to trap more heat, it could start to decay. Continued use of fossilized solar energy will allow in undesirable amounts of radiation from our sun. Right now, our ozone layer prevents the majority of the sun's ultraviolet radiation from reaching Earth, while allowing just enough sunlight to give us what we need to survive. Sunlight interacting with our skin produces vitamin D, which is a, a very useful vitamin. Vitamin D can protect us from a number of diseases, including the bone disorder osteoporosis and heart disease. But here, too, a balance has been struck. 
Too much sun can alter our DNA, causing skin cancer. Maintaining the equilibrium between sun and earth that allows life to thrive will require using less of the sun's ancient energy and more of the energy it delivers on a daily basis. After all, the sun's energy output is estimated to be 386 billion billion megawatts. Meaning in 15 minutes, our star radiates as much energy as all life on earth consumes in one year. Tapping this power source has been the goal of scientists for decades. For sheer size, a solar satellite would be unprecedented. A structure 35 to 40 square miles covered with solar cells, able to capture the sun's energy 24 hours a day and beam it to Earth. NASA has yet to achieve a goal on that scale, but their work with solar technologies in space has advanced technology here on Earth. History of solar cells is essentially a technology that came back down to Earth from space. When we first started to work on the Apollo and Mercury and Gemini programs, we needed power plants in space. Solar cells were a natural way to do that. Currently, we have two ways of directly harnessing the sun's energy. Solar thermal, which converts the sun's energy into heat by concentrating it enough to drive turbines, and solar panels, which use silicon-based technology to directly convert the energy from above into electricity. We can indirectly tap into the sun's power through wind turbines, capturing the energy produced by the weather the sun helps create. These technologies are constantly being improved. But some of the most interesting new science is coming from a very old process, photosynthesis. There's some really exciting opportunities as we move from the world of semiconductor solar cells to organic ones. Attempting to mimic Mother Nature, scientists have been able to create electricity from something found at the farmer's market, spinach. There's organic molecules in spinach in all green plants, but spinach happens to have a very convenient one where you can harvest that peptide, that molecule. Researchers were then able to put that peptide into a kind of solar sandwich, placing it between two electrically conductive materials. And when it's exposed to sunlight, it will circulate electrons, which is current, which is electricity. So these organic molecules can actually become little solar cells. In order to maintain the balance between Earth and our nearest star, it's become clear we must focus on finding ways to fuel our lives with the energy the sun supplies today. After all, the promise of solar energy is that for as long as the sun shines, its power can be ours. But what will happen when its power becomes too plentiful? The elements that make up the sun, the earth, and even humankind all come from one place, stardust. The remains of stars that lived billions of years ago. And just as those stars died, so too will our sun. In about five billion years, the sun will pretty rapidly become much more powerful, much brighter, and much bigger. The sun will reach a stage where it has burned through all of its hydrogen. And once that happens, it will start to burn through all of its helium. The sun will start to expand as it reaches a, a stage called a red giant. Uh, as it expands, it will start to expand into much larger size and fill the inner solar system. The orbits of the planets themselves will actually expand outward as well because it's not as massive. During that stage, some instabilities, which I call cosmic burps, will cause the sun's outer atmosphere to be gently ejected. The outer layers of the red giant will just keep drifting off at some slow rate. The hot inner layers of the sun will ionize that cloud of gas surrounding it and cause it to glow. So our sun will be surrounded by these glowing clouds of gas. They will form what's called a planetary nebulae. They're beautiful shapes. They're, some are just purely round, but some have been distorted into other shapes. They've come off non-symmetrically from the star underneath. What'll remain is the contracting core of our sun and it won't produce any new energy through nuclear reactions because all the nuclear reactions will have stopped. So it'll continue contracting and slowly fading with time. It's very similar to the process that creates, say, supernova, but our sun is not big enough, doesn't have enough stuff to actually create a supernova. So its, its final stage will be this object we call a white dwarf star. What remains is this little, relatively small white dwarf star and it is a very 
quiet, um, what we call happily retired star. It'll be about the size of the Earth. It won't get any smaller, and it'll sit around as this very highly compressed rock forever. It'll just liberate its energy, growing ever colder and dimmer with time, until finally it just fades from view. The death of the sun will have catastrophic effects on the solar system. If the massive expansion doesn't swallow the nearby planets, it will likely change their orbits and superheat them, including Earth. Earth's surface will be fried to a crisp. The Earth is probably going to get baked one way or the other. I mean, imagine the sun being one or 200 times brighter than it is right now. Imagine how much the Earth would be heated. It would not be a pleasant place to be. It actually may get baked before the sun completely dies because uh, the sun will get hotter before, even before it becomes a red giant and gets as large as the orbit of the Earth. Uh, it'll get warmer and at some point the Earth will get hot enough so that water will boil. So the oceans will evaporate away and all of life as we know it will cease to exist. If there's anything left of the Earth, the sun will shrink down to a white dwarf and the Earth will, instead of heating, freeze. This will not be a pleasant place to live. But that's billions and billions of years from now. Uh, we've only had rockets in space, satellites, for 50 years or so. We're talking, and now we're talking billions. So clearly we'll be able to travel around the solar system at the very least to uh, go to places that will be at the temperature that the Earth is now, and we'll be able by that time to go to more distant solar systems. So I don't spend a lot of time worrying about what's going to happen to the sun in five billion years. The sun gave us our life, and it will eventually take it away. And though the Earth will die, it and everything on it will in some part live on. The stardust that gave Earth and all of its inhabitants life will one day become the stardust that gives rise to a new generation of planets, stars, and life. The universe is going to end. It won't happen for billions of years, but there is no way out. Figuring out how it will end is the challenge of astrophysicists around the world. They're pointing high-tech equipment out toward the heavens to unlock the secret of our fate. The possibilities are frightening. In one scenario, gravity pulls the universe back into itself, similar to air being let out of an inflated balloon. The universe goes back to its original size. This is the big crunch. It'll be the end of the universe in a big fireball as all the matter collapses onto itself. That'd be pretty dramatic. Then there's the big chill. The universe expands until the nuclear furnaces that power all the stars burn out. The universe grows cold and dies. A second possibility is actually kind of sad. The universe will continue to expand forever and it will just grow into an increasingly cold and lonely place as the expansion removes our nearest neighbors from us and we just end up a single isolated community of stars and galaxies. Then again, there could be a much more spectacular end in which everything is ripped to shreds down to the last atom. Think of it like a balloon that is filled with too much air. It pops. It's much more dramatic than the big chill and just as fateful as the big crunch. The universe continues to expand, but at an ever quickening pace. And in fact, the pace is so great that even the space-time fabric cannot hold the universe together. However the end comes, it will be a dramatic conclusion. To understand how it all could end, scientists turn to how it began. The mystery starts to be solved here, at the Mount Wilson Observatory overlooking Pasadena, California. In 1929, while looking through what was then the world's largest telescope, Edwin Hubble makes a strange discovery. The universe is expanding. Hubble's discovery led to a whole new picture of the universe, that it was a dynamic environment and that it evolved. 
it changed in time. And that's different from pictures that people had of cosmology previous to that. Before Hubble, scientists said that the universe was static and unchanging. Hubble's discovery that the universe is expanding meant it had a starting point, a beginning. That brought the idea forward that, hey, what if we ran the film backwards in time and found the point at which that began? The Big Bang. That fraction of a second when the universe and everything in it exploded into existence from a point smaller than an atom. One common misconception about the Big Bang is that we can identify a point in space where the Big Bang occurred. But in fact, it's more appropriate to think of the Big Bang as a simultaneous creation everywhere of space, which is then continuing to expand to the present day. Scientists theorize that at the moment of the Big Bang, the first small particles of matter called quarks were produced. They collided to form the building blocks of the universe. These floated in a thick fog of hot plasma for about 400,000 years. Gravity also created at the Big Bang drew the particles together eventually creating the first stars and lighting up the cosmos. The theory of the Big Bang is a very solid theory. What happened at the moment of the Big Bang is still something we're working on. We don't really understand. If the universe has been expanding since the Big Bang, scientists must consider that it will stop expanding at some point. The question is, how? The most obvious answer involves gravity. What goes up must come down. Stars and galaxies and everything else might reverse direction. The universe would collapse in what some scientists call a big crunch. Take the top and then see the other handle and just jerk them apart. A model rocket offers clues to how the big crunch would work. The rocket is like the universe expanding into space out of the Big Bang. An initial bang allows the rocket to overcome the pull of gravity. Five, four, three, two, one! Eventually, when the fuel is exhausted, the rocket coasts a few feet higher, stops, and is pulled back to Earth. This is what would happen with a big crunch. The entire universe is essentially pulled back to its launch pad. The universe itself has its own momentum, its own energy, it's moving outward. But eventually, there's a point where possibly the universe will stop that moving outward, just like the rocket that we saw and have to fall back in upon itself and collapse again under the force of its own gravity. In this scenario, the universe could return to its original state just before the Big Bang, setting the stage for a perpetual seesaw of creation and destruction. The Big Crunch theory moved to a scientific back burner. Cosmologists figured out that there must be some form of energy that keeps the universe from collapsing. The existence of such a force leads to new theories about what the universe is made of and how it might end. And evidence about how this might play out is found in some of the most powerful and mysterious phenomena in the cosmos. Black holes. Predicting how the universe will end 
involves some of the most advanced technology known to man. On a remote volcano on the island of Hawaii, astronomers are monitoring a battle in space that is shaping the fate of the universe. At an elevation of nearly 14,000 feet, the Keck telescopes bring astronomers from all over the world nearer to space for a clearer view of the cosmos. They come here because the telescopes work best far away from city lights and as high as possible above Earth's polluted air. Harsh conditions make it difficult to work here, but for scientists in pursuit of the great mysteries above, it's paradise. So this is a remarkable location, but of course the air is very thin, it's extremely hard to work here, but these telescopes are amazingly powerful. But we're ambitious astronomers. We don't just stop looking at easy objects. We try hard to look at the very faintest objects so we can understand the extremities of the universe. Here, astronomers like Richard Ellis are working on a problem that has been all-consuming for cosmologists since Edwin Hubble. They know the universe is expanding, but what they don't know is how fast. It will be difficult to predict exactly how the universe will end until they solve this mystery. The answers lie in the past. Now what we were looking at, what I did the focus on was a V equals 12. There it is. Yeah. Okay, that's the dry star. We have... Get a better focus now, that was worth doing. An astronomer like myself uses a ground-based telescope as a time machine. We're looking back in time to study distant galaxies seen as they were a long, long time ago. One of the distant galaxies that astronomers found revealed a powerful source of X-rays from something that they could not see. It was in the constellation Cygnus and emitted no light, but something was there. Whatever was emitting these X-rays had a mass about seven times that of Earth's sun. There wasn't a name for it, so they called it a black hole. Black holes offer scientists an analogy to how the big crunch theory works. When certain stars run out of fuel, they collapse in on themselves into a smaller and far denser mass that attracts more and more matter, just like the Big Crunch. The gravitational pull is so powerful that anything that falls near a black hole will be forever trapped. Not even light can escape. It's a mind-boggling concept that something invisible is detectable and offers a view to our ultimate fate. This black tarp represents space, and space is relatively flat, but when you put a massive object into space, it curves it. This is a penny, and notice how it comes into a really beautiful circular orbit. Basically, the black hole trapped it into an orbit around itself, and that orbit becomes very circular as it gets closer. And now the penny will eventually disappear, go inside the black hole. Earth's sun warps space similarly to a black hole, only it's a cosmic wimp by comparison. The gravitational pull of our sun is much weaker. Earth and all its nearby planets are trapped by the sun's pull, but it's so mild that it just stays in orbit without being sucked into the sun. The mass of a black hole can be a million times the mass of the sun, or more, causing a huge warp in the space around it that consumes everything that comes near. That black hole wraps space around itself. And so if material falls near it, it falls inside and gets trapped forever. Black holes exist in isolated areas throughout the cosmos. A black hole's gravitational pull is a scaled-down version of the force that could cause the universe to collapse. That force is dark matter, and dark matter is what scientists often call cosmic glue. Hi, Matthew. So let's do some cosmology here. <laughs> dark matter uh, attracts other objects via its gravitational attraction. It's a positive force. There's another force that opposes gravity, and that is dark energy. Dark energy, we don't really understand what it is, but it's a negative repulsing effect that pushes galaxies away from each other. 
The whirlpool, in Richard Ellis's demonstration, represents the gravitational force of dark matter. The green dye coming out of the syringe shows how the stuff of the universe collapses under the force of dark matter. The presence of dark matter acts as the focus for the gas in the universe, bringing structure together. This is how the Milky Way developed as the universe expanded. Little things merging into big things, the positive, constructive force of gravity. Now, if this was the only force in the universe, the universe would stop expanding at some point in the future, and eventually the universe would start collapsing. Gravity would eventually halt the expansion, bring it back together in a big crunch. Yet the universe continues to expand and isn't showing any signs of collapsing. This suggests the opposing force of dark energy could be stronger than dark matter. But it will take scientific detective work to find out. They look to one of the most violent forces in the universe for clues. We're studying exploding stars to try to understand if they can tell us the rate at which the universe is expanding. These are explosions at the end of the lives of stars, not unlike our sun. The fuel that these stars have in their centers is, is spent. The star collapses, the outer part expands, and the star becomes something called a white dwarf. White dwarf stars sometimes have other stars orbiting nearby, a companion star. A massive explosion could happen if the companion star's debris falls onto the white dwarf, causing a spectacular fireworks display in the cosmos. Scientists consider exploding stars, or supernovae, like in these images captured by the Hubble telescope, to be reliable telltales of how fast the universe expands. Their brief and bright explosions allow scientists to track the universe's expansion and give them a way to measure its speed. Essentially, they are white dwarf stars that become nuclear bombs. They explode with a certain brightness and a certain length of time. It takes a certain amount of time for that brightness to dissipate. They are essentially standard candles. Any one of these will look the same no matter where it is in the universe. Astronomers measure the distance and speed of these exploding stars by measuring the amount of red light they emit. The faster the star moves away from us, the redder its light appears. The expansion rate of galaxies containing stars like supernovae can then be used to interpret how the rest of the universe is moving outward. We know this because we can compare the velocities of galaxies with their distances. These are the clues that lead astronomers to answer just how soon the universe will reverse direction and come back together in a big crunch. Or, this information might lead to an entirely different conclusion. Dr. Ellis is looking at clues at the Keck Observatory in Hawaii. While the telescope is on the top of a huge volcano, he's in a viewing room on another part of the island. Hey, emission lines, Johan. Oh, you, you see it? In the red, in the red side, I think. At the same time, Johan Richard is at the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena, California, evaluating the light from a distant galaxy that the Keck telescope captured in Hawaii. He's looking to see if any of the known elements coming from the galaxy are in the red spectrum and moving farther away. We can interpret that as a velocity, as how much uh, the galaxy is moving away from us. We can really interpret how the entire universe is behaving, is expanding. Interpreting redshift is the cornerstone of the quest to pin down the fate of the universe. Clearer pictures of the universe that have only been possible in recent years have led cosmologists to conclude that the redshift of distant galaxies is greater than predicted. This is startling. Not only is the universe expanding, it's speeding up. Nothing in the observable cosmos could account for an accelerating universe, and yet the data seem irrefutable. This has to mean that an invisible force is working against gravity. Cosmologists have come up with a name, 
dark energy. So when the universe was young, gravity was the most dominant force. And so what we see here is galaxies as particles on the surface of the water are bound together by gravity. And the point about seven billion years ago, dark energy and gravity are pretty well in balance. But the universe continues to expand, the density goes down, and so dark energy starts to take over. And lo and behold, the universe starts to accelerate. Uh, so dark energy is now the dominant property of space. So the universe started out with a certain amount of energy, and we know we're trying to understand how much energy there is, and we know the universe is expanding as it, as it moves outward with time. We also know now that the universe's expansion is accelerating, and we don't know, is that acceleration going to slow down or not? We're still trying to understand that. So in understanding what's going to happen to the fate of the universe, we have to know how much energy is there, how much matter is there. The history of the universe is really a battle between dark matter and dark energy. Uh, these two forces are in opposition. And so both the history of the universe and its ultimate fate is really the competition between these two forces. The Big Crunch theory was a result of scientists interpreting that dark matter is the dominant force. But astronomers now suspect that dark energy might be much stronger. If so, the end could be dramatic and violent. It pulls apart solar systems, it pulls apart stars, and eventually it grows so strong that it pulls apart matter itself, breaks bonds, pulls apart atoms, and reduces everything to fundamental particles, and that's the end of the universe. The battle between dark matter, the force that holds the universe together, and dark energy, the force seeking to tear it apart, has set the universe on a path of destruction. If dark matter is the victor, the universe might collapse. If dark energy rules the cosmos, it could rip to shreds. The expansion grows so strong that it tears up the entire universe. It'll be a strange twist of fate. Dark energy, the force that propelled matter to form a magnificent universe, continues to push it outward and drives it to its demise. To find out if dark energy is in fact winning the battle, scientists will first need to know how fast the universe is actually expanding. The most remarkable feature of the universe is that it's expanding. Every galaxy is moving away from every other galaxy. When you look out into the night sky, you see distant stars, galaxies, clusters of galaxies they observe with telescopes, and they're all moving away from us. We can illustrate that with this balloon. So we expand it. We see that every dot drawn on this black balloon, like the night sky, is moving away from every other dot. But there's something else that we know about the universe, something else that we know about the expansion, that is that the expansion is getting faster. The universe is accelerating. The size of the universe is getting bigger at a faster and faster rate. And we don't know exactly how fast it's accelerating, but if it's accelerating fast enough, then something really dramatic could happen. The universe could end up tearing itself apart in a big rip. This is perfect. This is great that you rigged this up. So this is, this is a giant version of the demo that I do in class. Dr. Robert Caldwell attempts an earthbound experiment to show how dark energy affects the acceleration of the universe. He uses a paintball gun mounted on a truck. Yeah, and basically, I mean, we could adjust the angle in any way that you want it. What do you think about this? Yeah, I think, this? I think down at down the ground, a bit you know, more. Is, uh, is the best so we can mark each How's time the, the gun fires. That'll be good. Let's try that. He sends the truck coasting down an incline. Earth's gravity pulls the vehicle downhill, which is similar to how dark energy propels the universe outward, causing it to expand. Gravity pulls the truck forward at an increasing speed. The gun fires paint at the ground at regular one second intervals. Caldwell measures the distance between the paint dots to calculate just how fast the truck was accelerating. He'll use the data from this experiment 
to see how gravity's force compares to dark energy's force in the cosmos. We started thinking about the Big Rip when it was discovered that the expansion of the universe was accelerating. The degree of acceleration is not known, and it's the subject of a lot of effort by astronomers today to try and figure out exactly how fast the expansion is growing. What is the past evolution of the universe in detail, and if we can glean from that, what is the future evolution of the universe? It's not known exactly how fast it's accelerating. There's some evidence that the acceleration is beyond a certain threshold, and beyond that threshold, there's a runaway effect that could take place and it would rip apart the universe. Hey, look. Fantastic. I think we've got some uh, good data. Excellent. How do we measure this? Great. Give you that end. All right. I'll take this. Uh, five feet, eight, eight and, and a half inches. The point of the paintball experiment is to find parallels between the truck propelled by the invisible force of gravity and the accelerating universe. I'm glad we got the long tape measure because it's really growing pretty fast, the interval. Within a few measurements, the distance between the paint spots increases by nearly seven times. If the truck were in space at this rate, it would travel faster than 100 miles per hour within a minute and over 1,000 miles per hour within 10 minutes. They're getting big now. Forty-two, all right, point five. The question for Robert Caldwell is whether the same kind of expansion and acceleration are happening on a cosmic scale. What's the uh, the, the capsule made of? Is it plastic or something? It's a gelatin. Uh huh. Okay. It's all biodegradable. Uh huh. So you could actually eat them if you wanted to. <laughs> yeah. This right here is the data that I took with Eric. The cumulative distance traveled by the car as a function of time. And that's beautiful, it's this nice parabolic shape. That's exactly what you expect for an accelerating body. Now over here I've got another calculation going on where I'm uh, working out the acceleration of the universe. Robert Caldwell's calculation shows that forces on Earth are similar to forces in space. This demonstration then gives a sense of the dramatic rate of expansion that appears to be happening in the cosmos. By eye, it might be difficult to appreciate how good a fit it is, but uh, I can tell you that the weight of the statistics indicates that an accelerating universe is a very good fit to this data. If, like the truck, the universe is continually accelerating, then billions of years from now, the universe might tear itself apart. All the distant stars and galaxies will be pulled away from, from each other. They'll be pulled away from us. But moreover, we won't have time to grow cold and lonely. It'll actually be pretty exciting and dramatic and violent. Stars are ripped apart, planets are ripped apart, and even atoms are, are torn apart before the universe ends. It wouldn't happen for at least 50 billion years but still, it's an interesting fate for the universe. What would atoms ripping apart look like? Things like coffee cups are solid. Atoms join together to create something that will hold a cappuccino without leaking a single drop. Zoom in through the cup, like sailing through the cosmos, past the molecules and into the atoms. The solid cup is nothing more than a fabric of atomic particles that formed a bond to become matter. If these particles were to move apart, the bonds that hold this cup together stop working. The atoms no longer support molecules. The connections between the minuscule particles dissolve. Matter in the form of this cup ceases to exist. It disintegrates, gone from existence. This is the dramatic end that Robert Caldwell foresees for the universe. What you would see if you were standing on Earth or standing on some other planet that uh, happened to still be around at that time, you would see something that looks like a wall of darkness approaching you. And as the wall of darkness approaches, 
uh, stars would go out, galaxies would go out, and then eventually uh, that wall of darkness would surround the planet. And then pretty soon, atoms themselves are torn apart, and that's it. Just the wall of darkness shrinks down to a point, and that's the end of the universe. According to Robert Caldwell, that moment is still billions of years off, leaving plenty of time to refine the research. In a way, this is like a detective story. We're trying to figure out what is the culprit or who is the culprit responsible for the cosmic acceleration. We think we know its name. We call it dark energy, but we don't know the modus operandi. We don't know exactly how it works. And what's needed is more information, more information about the physics behind the dark energy. We want to know exactly what it does and exactly what it's made out of. And in answering those questions, we'll be able to figure out exactly what is the fate of the universe. The Big Rip is one theory. Cruising just above Earth's atmosphere and peering deep into space, the Hubble telescope provides scientists with clues to a less violent, but equally unavoidable, end of the universe. Scientists now say the universe is expanding and that depending on how fast it is accelerating, it might end in a big rip where everything tears apart. It's also possible that it will continue to expand, but at a slower rate. The universe wouldn't rip apart, but would become dark, cold, and lifeless. If dark energy turns out to be constant, a constant property of space and continues at the same rate that it is now, the universe will keep expanding forever and it will be a very sad state. I think in the end, it just chills out. Everything cools down. Evidence for the big chill and all of the theories for the end of the universe, in part, come from the Hubble Space Telescope. It has been orbiting Earth since 1990 and has an unobstructed view of the cosmos. The extraordinary images it beams back to Earth are amazing in their clarity and detail. And because of Hubble, scientists can make better predictions about how the universe will end. So here is an example of a, a very deep field that was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, which literally you point the space telescope at a single region uh, in space. And if you looked at this from a typical uh, ground-based image before Hubble was launched, first of all, it's, it's a, literally a, almost size of a postage stamp. And so suddenly, the first Hubble deep field that was ever taken had 4,000 galaxies that looked just like the galaxies here that were never visible before from the ground. A tremendous power. Each of these smudges in their own right um, is another galaxy. Each one of these galaxies contains about 100 billion stars. Hubble sees more than just stars and galaxies. It just might be on to one of the key ingredients of space, an invisible ingredient that could put the brakes on dark energy's effect and cause a big chill. That's dark matter. Scientists talk about dark matter as the substance that holds the universe together and could prevent a big rip. Evidence that dark matter exists is seen in some of Hubble's images of nearby galaxies. It sometimes appears as though other galaxies surround them. The other galaxies are not really there at all. Rather, they are reflections of more distant galaxies coming from behind. Astronomers suspect this optical illusion is dark matter causing a weird distortion of light called gravitational lensing. The light from the more distant galaxies is literally bent by the curvature of space caused by stars and dark matter in its path. The more dark matter there is between Earth and the distant galaxy, the more the light will be bent and the greater the force to cause a big chill. The gravitational lensing is a tremendous tool for the astronomer because we can measure the distortion in background galaxies and use it to trace the distribution of dark matter on various scales. We're looking at a distribution of idealized galaxies here on the sky, 
and the light from these distant galaxies is passing through clumps of dark matter. What you look at is not really what's happening. Uh, it's a bit like wearing spectacles and not knowing that you're wearing them. And if you can tell how much that bending is occurring, you can map the dark matter, and you can also see, well, if there's dark matter there, is the universe around that dark matter behaving the way it should given the gravity or not? If it's slightly gravitating less, then dark energy might be changing in those places. Identifying which energy force dominates, dark matter or dark energy, will give scientists more confidence about whether a big chill or a big rip will be our fate. The best evidence shows dark energy as the driving force, but by how much? Solving this mystery depends on astronomers finding ways to measure how fast the universe is moving. On Earth, it's simple to determine how fast something moves. An airplane, for example, is relatively close. We can look at it and calculate its speed by estimating the distance it travels and timing how long it takes to get from one point to another. But a star's light can travel for millions or billions of years before it can be seen on Earth. By the time its light gets here, the star will be long gone and it's too far away to gauge its speed or distance traveled with any certainty. The universe is expanding. Only scientists cannot give precise answers about how fast. The mystery moves closer to being solved by imaging the cosmos with greater precision. Clearer images from space make it easier to estimate the rate of expansion. If the universe continues to expand with time, then ultimately all of the energy sources, the nuclear furnaces and stars, would run out and die, and the universe would actually get very cold, and there'd be something called a big chill. In the big chill scenario, Earth could become a lonely, cold planet as the universe expands. Distances between stars grow so vast that they nearly disappear from view. Over time, they burn out, and eventually the entire universe ends in a frozen state. This sphere demonstrates the principles behind a big chill. The marbles coming out of the sphere are like stars that were formed following the Big Bang. Dark energy propels the stars outward. Dark matter slows them down. In a big chill, the expansion would continue but the nuclear fuel that causes the stars to burn will eventually run out. From Earth's perspective, the first thing to go would be sunlight. The sun dims as it exhausts its last bits of nuclear fuel. Earth would freeze and become lifeless. And billions of years after humans are gone, the cosmos expands out of view. A few newer stars might remain, but most would have long moved away. The furnace powering the universe burns out. The darkened universe continues to expand, a frozen and lifeless remnant of its once vibrant existence. Eventually, if this keeps going, if, if nothing changes in the, in the composition of this energy density, the universe will continue to expand forever. It's going to get colder and colder. And eventually, even the gal our neighboring galaxies will be receding from us so fast that we won't be able to see them. So the universe is going to get cold and dark, and, uh, and it will be a very lonely place. Astronomers have much to learn about the influence of dark energy and dark matter and much of the newest information is coming from this probe in deep space. It's sending back information that's helping scientists to interpret the history and the fate of the universe. The night sky, by all appearance, is a quiet and peaceful place. 
but in reality, there are forces that are driving it to an end. Big science moves astronomers closer to deciphering the universe's great mysteries, including its ultimate fate. The solution to the universe's riddle may well be hidden in this multicolored image. What's incredible is that it's a map of the early universe from the moment it was conceived. And even more fantastic, it reveals a great story that helps cosmologists predict how it will end. The machine that captured this is called WMAP, a NASA satellite that's working around the clock to chart the cosmos. What we're looking at here is the edge of the visible universe. It's the light that WMAP measured, left, it's the remnant heat from the Big Bang, and this is literally the oldest light in the universe that we can see. This fossil relic from the early universe tells us a great deal about what the composition of matter was like, what the expansion rate was like, and really what the conditions were at the birth of our universe. WMAP is one of the great astronomical breakthroughs of the 21st century. Nothing before could give us such a clear image of the energy left over from the Big Bang, energy that scientists call the cosmic microwave background. WMAP is measuring temperature differences in the cosmic microwave background, which may finally make it possible to predict which force will dominate the universe and how that force will bring the cosmos to its end. The blue spots are regions in the uh, microwave light that was produced by the Big Bang that are slightly colder than the average temperature, and the red spots are regions that are slightly hotter than the average. Temperature differences revealed by WMAP tell scientists about the nature of the matter and energy that is contained within the universe. They're able to analyze the light patterns and find clues not only about the substance, but also the fate of the universe. We only capture a tiny part of the electromagnetic spectrum with our eyes, and we have to go to much longer wavelengths. The same wavelengths that are used to heat water in a microwave oven are what we're measuring here with WMAP. WMAP is so precise that it can detect differences in temperatures as small as one one thousandth of a degree. This sensitivity helps scientists to calculate the ratio of dark matter to dark energy, forces that will determine how the universe ends. We assemble all those difference measurements and, and make a map of what the variations look like. And by turning up the, uh, the contrast, we can, we can basically subtract off this uniform glow from the Big Bang and look for a variation. It doesn't look like much until Gary Hinshaw adjusts the contrast. Then the WMAP image comes to life. Looking at WMAP imagery, is in essence taking a journey back through space and time so that we might get some new ideas on the fate of the universe. Pulling away from the probe and following the path of the light it is collecting, we pass Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn whose reflected light takes over an hour to reach Earth. Then, leaving the Milky Way, we pass Andromeda, the next nearest galaxy, whose light takes 2.3 million years to reach us, which means we have traveled 2.3 million years back in time. Finally, we arrive back 13 billion years ago, at the beginning of visible light. Before that, superheated hydrogen gas is everywhere. WMAP can see this far back in history. It's confirming important facts about the universe and what's driving it to its demise. The final act for the universe becomes more easily predicted thanks to WMAP. Its information, combined with the work of astronomers, has led to some astounding discoveries concerning a rapidly expanding universe. 
Rapid expansion supports the dark energy theory and the possibility of a big chill or big rip. We now know from all the data we've had in the last 10 years that there's by a factor of two to one more dark energy than dark matter. So dark energy is the dominant constituent of uh, energy in the universe. The evidence seems clear. Dark energy is taking over and is leading astronomers into new thoughts about the beginning and the end of the universe. Before the discovery of dark energy, things were a lot simpler. If we could determine the amount of matter in the universe, then we could say something about its ultimate destiny. Those simple days are gone, but the proof is adding up and supports the idea that the universe will continue to expand. But will it do so to oblivion? We've made huge strides over the last century in learning something about the evolution of the universe and its expansion. But we've now raised more questions in some sense than we've been able to answer. And so I think the next decade is going to be even more exciting. Astronomers have tons and tons of challenges that have been thrown our way by theorists. And we are rapidly trying to figure out how to answer all of these questions. And I think that's the exciting future because if you, if you can go out and really observe something, you're testing it. And that's what science is all about. The battle between dark matter and dark energy is expected to go on for billions of years. And humans will be long gone from Earth when the final outcome occurs. But no pursuit has been more significant to science than understanding how the universe arrived, how it works, and how it will end. It's a never-ending quest. It's driving astronomy. What are the answers to these profound questions? The constituents of the universe, the nature of dark matter, and perhaps the biggest mystery of all, what is the ultimate fate of the universe? cosmic boulder rockets in from deep space on a direct collision course with Earth. When it hits, it unleashes a global catastrophe. This is not science fiction. It happened 65 million years ago. And much of life on Earth, including the dinosaurs, died. Today, many scientists believe that this is not a one-time event. That what wiped out the dinosaurs could happen again. And we could be next. Will another impact occur? You bet. It's going to happen again. The Earth is sitting out there with a bullseye on it. What are these mysterious invaders? Where do they come from? And if one threatens the Earth again, Will we be able to stop it in time? We think of comets as some of the heavens more spectacular sights. And most are benign, orbiting harmlessly around the sun. But some will inevitably collide with another body, like Earth. At speeds of over 40,000 kilometers an hour, even a small cosmic radar can wreak enormous havoc, as one did in Arizona's northern desert 50,000 years ago. It began as a brilliant glow in the northern sky. It was over in an instant. The huge rock about 20 meters wide, left a crater one and a half kilometers across and 230 meters deep. In cosmic terms, this was a relatively small collision. If the same boulder struck today, just 56 kilometers west, it would destroy the town of Flagstaff, Arizona, and its population of 56,000 people. An even larger collision, with an object a mile or more in diameter, could cause devastation on a global scale. When impact by a comet will kill so many people and can produce such long-term changes in the environment that it can be a complete catastrophe for all of humanity. 
Most scientists now believe a single blast from space helped wipe out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. A comet or asteroid about 10 kilometers across slammed into Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. It dug a crater nearly 80 kilometers wide and 32 kilometers deep in less than a second and unleashed an explosion more powerful than all the world's nuclear weapons combined. The force of the shockwaves triggered earthquakes worldwide and sent tsunamis surging across the oceans. A mammoth dirt cloud erupted into the sky, engulfing the globe and blocking out the sun for years. The dinosaurs slowly perished. And they were not alone. More than half of the Earth's species were also wiped out. In our solar system, there are two kinds of cosmic bullets capable of devastation on a planetary scale. Asteroids and comets. Asteroids are essentially tiny planets, dense boulders of rock and metal, left over from the formation of our solar system 4.6 billion years ago. Most are bunched between Mars and Jupiter in an orbit called the asteroid belt. Comets, on the other hand, are far more mysterious. Though also formed at the birth of our solar system, they are made up of rock and ice. Many, like Halley's Comet, orbit the Sun in predictable paths on predictable schedules. But there are countless others we know nothing about. They come hurtling out of the ether at unimaginable speeds of up to 160,000 kilometers an hour. For scientists peering into space, they appear as lumps of charcoal on a black canvas, invisible until they are practically upon us. Only near the sun do comets become easier to detect. These icy bodies shed gas and dust as the sun warms them. When light hits the debris, they blaze into view and can be seen for millions of kilometers. But by that time, if one is headed for us, it may be too late to do anything to stop it. To date, more than a thousand comets have been identified. Every year, we spot perhaps a hundred comets we've never seen before entering the inner solar system. Each new arrival increases the odds that one will eventually strike the Earth. The Earth is in a cosmic shooting gallery. We get hit by pieces of comets and asteroids of all size, and the big ones certainly pose a very real threat. It's only a matter of time before the comet is in the same place as the Earth. Giant pockmarks all over our planet testify to past assaults. And these collisions may be more frequent than we like to think. The latest happened a little more than a century ago. In 1908, a massive explosion rocked Tunguska in Russia's remote region of Siberia. Eyewitnesses described a flying star with a fiery tail. The sky opened to the ground and a fire brighter than the sun poured out. Whether an asteroid or a comet, it collided with the Earth's dense atmosphere at such a high rate of speed, the friction caused it to explode in mid-air. It blew up five miles above the surface of the Earth, creating this huge explosion and lit up the atmosphere for days. You could actually read in Europe at night. The Tunguska blast was bigger and more powerful than the eruption of Mount St. Helens. It left no telltale crater. But it did flatten a forest of millions of trees over hundreds of square kilometers. An area bigger than that of Washington, D.C. 
If that would have happened over a metropolitan area, it would have just wiped out the population for thousands of square kilometers around the impact site. To astronomers, Tunguska was a near miss, a relatively minor impact. What would a truly catastrophic collision look like? In 1994, scientists got a vivid demonstration when a comet slammed into Jupiter. Astronomers first spotted Shoemaker-Levy 9 just over a year earlier. As the comet made its way from the outer solar system toward the Sun, it had passed close to Jupiter, dangerously close. Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system. It has an enormous gravitational pull. As the comet passed by, the giant planet pulled it nearer. Then, the comet began to break apart. These lighter pieces, less than three kilometers in diameter, had no chance against Jupiter's mammoth pull. On July the 16th, 1994, they began to crash into the surface at speeds of more than 160,000 kilometers an hour. If there was any doubt that comets could hit planets, this showed it, you know, perfectly. Here's a string of comets in this, the solar system that are hitting the planet one by one. The explosions were enormous. Each impact sent plumes of dust and debris soaring thousands of kilometers into Jupiter's atmosphere and left huge scars on the gaseous giant's surface, some bigger than the Earth. The so-called G-fragment hit with uh, six million megatons of equivalent energy. That's roughly equivalent to a Hiroshima-like blast every second for 13 years. What would a collision even a fraction of that size do to our Earth? A major impact from a comet would have devastating effects for the Earth. Imagine the following scenario. Scientists have spotted a three kilometer wide comet on a collision course with our planet. It's too late to stop it. The first thing you'll know is when the sky lights up and the ground shakes. Brilliant meteors streak across the sky as the giant comet's debris strikes the Earth's atmosphere. Forests would catch fire, ignited by the superheated air. When the comet hits, the blast would kick up millions of tons of fiery rock and dirt. The airborne debris would blanket the planet and block out the sun. Day turning to permanent night bringing freezing temperatures and year-round winter. It would take more than a year for the dust to settle and for sunlight to filter through the clouds. When it finally did, the Earth would start to warm quickly. Elevated levels of gases created by the fires would turn the planet into a sweltering greenhouse. Millions of species that survived the earlier cold would be unable to take the heat. They would die. It would take thousands of years for life on Earth to recover. How great are the odds a comet will strike the Earth? Will another impact occur? You bet. It's going to happen again. The Earth is sitting out there with a bullseye on it. The chances of a major impact in our lifetimes may be slim, perhaps in the order of one in 100,000. But astronomers the world over are working fervently to understand these strangers in our midst, struggling to learn what comets are and where they come from. Mankind's ultimate survival may depend on our ability to stop one before it strikes us. In the 17th century, stargazers observed how some comets orbit the sun in regular intervals, like the planets. One astronomer even predicted the return of the comet that now bears his name, Halley. But no one knew what they were made of or where they came from. As late as 1950, astronomers could only guess at their true nature. 
Fred Whipple, the father of cometary astronomy, envisioned comets as flying mountains of frozen gases, ice, dust and dirt. He called them dirty snowballs. He theorized that as comets neared the sun, they shed dust and gas as their ice vaporized, forming their signature tails. It wasn't until the 1980s that astronomers were able to test Whipple's theories by approaching these speeding ice balls. What they discovered surprised them. In 1985, as part of the International Sun-Earth Explorer program, they flew a spacecraft loaded with sensors through a comet's tail. In 1986, the European Space Agency sent a craft called Giotto to study Comet Halley's nucleus. The scientists feared the debris flying from Halley would destroy Giotto. It didn't. The craft not only withstood the pummeling, it sent back amazing photos of a cratered, sponge-like surface with jets of gas shooting from within. Suddenly, scientists began to wonder exactly how rock-solid comets really are. In the year 2000, they got more clues. On its approach to the sun, a comet named Linea unexpectedly blew apart. Earth and space-based telescopes captured the explosion, allowing scientists to analyze the chemical composition of the nucleus for the first time. That information combined with data from the early flybys, confirmed what astronomers were beginning to suspect. Comets are not ice hard. They are surprisingly fluffy, porous and fragile. Johns Hopkins University's Hal Weaver simulates the comet's unexpected makeup. Okay, we're gonna make one of the most primitive objects in the solar system, a cometary nucleus. These cotton balls were just barely held together. One of them just fell off. And as comets pass through the, through the inner solar system, they get heated up. And sometimes these little cotton balls just fly off and break apart. Comets consist primarily of chunks of water, dirt, ammonia, and carbon. Molasses in this experiment. They are permeated throughout with frozen gas, what we know as dry ice. As comets near the sun, the ice vaporizes, releasing gas and dust that form the characteristic tail. You see the ice subliming going directly from the solid phase to the vapor phase. This is exactly what happens when a comet's going around the sun. It doesn't look like your original concept of a comet, does it? But it's a single solid object. You can see active regions on the surface bubbling up we get activity only on specific spots for a lot of the comets. And as they fly by through the inner solar system and heat up, sometimes chunks just drop off. And sometimes we see the comet completely disintegrate. This new knowledge about the fragility of comets may seem reassuring. How can they do so much damage? But as they race through space at more than 10 kilometers a second, even small comets can spell disaster. Donald Yeomans studies comets for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Well, they are fragile, and you could break them apart with your hands perhaps, but they're huge. You know, they're 10 miles in diameter, and so it doesn't really matter that they're fragile. They're so big that they've got a lot of mass, and it's mass and velocity that's important when they hit. We can't stop a comet heading towards Earth if we can't see it. But that's another mystery plaguing scientists. Where do these cosmic travelers come from? Astronomers have long observed comets emerging from deep space. To know exactly where they've been, they would need to get their hands on actual comet dust, a record of a comet's birth and its travels. Three, green board all the way across. Two, we have main engine start. 
zero and liftoff of the Stardust space. In February 1999, NASA's Stardust spacecraft began a voyage to rendezvous with a distant comet named Vild 2. Its bold mission was to collect dust from Vild 2 and return it to Earth. By raising a giant gel-filled petri dish, roughly 30 centimeters in diameter, it collected more than a thousand samples as it sped by the comet at almost 32,000 kilometers an hour. The mission was a remarkable success. In January 2006, seven years after liftoff, Stardust's cargo capsule returned to Earth. Contents have been a treasure trove for scientists. We thought comets all formed from stuff pretty far from the sun. We're finding in this comet grains that formed right next to our sun. Born near Earth, when our solar system was formed, the comet then fell into an orbit that took it far beyond, according to surprising new data from Stardust, much farther than scientists once thought. It's not just material from our own solar system at its birth stages, but also materials from, from different distant stars mix in as well. Also materials forming far from it and just sort of like passing by. It's a real grab bag of, of things in our galaxy. The story of the comet's origin begins 4.6 billion years ago. Our solar system is in the midst of a fitful birth. In the center, a cloud of gas and dust begins to contract into an immense disk. The disk's powerful gravity sucks masses of matter inwards. Pressures and temperatures soar until the enormous, dense ball ignites, its gases and matter imploding in nuclear fusion. A star, our sun, is born. Left to orbit the newborn sun is a fog of debris. The fragments careen into one another and clump together into celestial dust balls. Over millions of years, these monster clumps grow larger as they orbit the Sun, until they form an array of planets, including our Earth. But some dust balls, future comets, do not merge and condense into planets. A billion or more slowly gravitate to an orbit between Neptune and Pluto, a region called the Kuiper Belt. Trillions of others are exiled partway to the next star, to a nebulous realm called the Oort Cloud, hurled outward by the gravitational fields of large planets like Jupiter. They have elliptical orbits that vary greatly. You've got the Kuiper Belt region of comets, and they're mostly compressed into a plate-like distribution. But in the Oort cloud, which is a thousand times further out, they're in a, a veritable cloud. It's, so you've got objects in this kind of an orbit, this kind of an orbit, that kind of an orbit. They're coming in from the outermost edge of the solar system. Amazingly, astronomers did not confirm the Kuiper Belt's existence until 1992, even though it is part of our solar system. Today, they believe the Kuiper Belt is the outer range of comets with the most stable orbits, those that enter the inner solar system every three to two hundred years. The best known of these, Halley, returns every 76. But it is the second region, the Oort Cloud, two light years away, that troubles scientists most. Scientists believe an occasional disruption like a change in a star's gravitational field will eject a comet from this cloud. It can then fall under the gravitational pull of our own sun and start a journey towards our inner solar system taking thousands of years. Scientists have no way to predict when these comets will appear and they can come from any direction. One 
may already be on a collision course with Earth. For these fragile outcasts, every journey into the inner solar system is fraught with peril. Some will lose their icy payload and become dormant as the sun burns off their gases. Some will break apart as their icy glue melts in the solar heat. The fragments may continue to circle the sun, appearing to us as meteor showers or shooting stars. Some comets will enter Jupiter's orbit, drawn by its enormous gravitational field. The giant planet then catapults the invaders back out of the solar system. But some will run full tilt into another heavenly body. In 1997, the world awoke to a comet secretly entering our solar system. Two amateur astronomers spotted an unknown intruder near Jupiter, more brilliant than any they had seen before. Dubbed Hale Bop after its discoverers, it was a visitor from the Oort cloud on its first journey around the Sun in almost 5,000 years. The comets we most often see are little more than asteroids. Their gas and loose dust burned off in their frequent jogs around the Sun. But comets like Hale Bop, just out of the Oort cloud's deep freeze, have plenty of ice and dust to shed. They've got water ice. They've got uh, carbon dioxide ice, uh, dry ice. Uh, they've got carbon monoxide ice. And all of these ices are much more volatile than water. So when they get in the inner solar system, they go nuts. Fortunately, we could marvel without fear at Hale Bob's glorious moment in the sun. It sailed by unobstructed, 200 million kilometers from Earth, just a bit further away than our sun. But what if it had been on a collision course with our planet? In 1992, the United States government launched an aggressive program to analyze the threat comets and asteroids pose to Earth. It's called the Space Guard Survey. Today, scientists all over the world are involved in the painstaking process. They point their telescopes at a single region of the sky and take periodic snapshots. Then they line up the images, looking for anything that moves from frame to frame. We are looking first for the larger asteroids and comets, the ones a mile or so in diameter, and eventually we'll extend it to the smaller ones. Scientists estimate our solar system has more than a thousand comets and asteroids that are around a kilometer in diameter. So far, searchers have identified over 700 of them. And those are just the giants that can do apocalyptic damage. We may never be able to locate every threat. There could be millions of comets and asteroids that measure a hundred meters or so, the length of a sports field. That's more than three times the size of the rock that slammed into Arizona 50,000 years ago. Still, telescopes are a first line of defense against what could be a major disaster for our planet. If you don't look, you won't know anything's coming. We would be taken by surprise just as much as the dinosaurs. If you do carry out a survey, then you hope that you can have warning. But it's one or the other. Either you have years or decades of warning, or you're taken completely by surprise. There's nothing in between. There's three things that are important. You have to find them early, you have to find them early, and you have to find them early. Suppose we do detect a comet headed for Earth then what can we do? 
scientists have just started to come up with solutions. One of the leading ideas? Smash a rocket into it, to slow it or knock it off course. That's harder than it may seem. If comets were hard ice balls, as first thought, a powerful thump from a rocket might do the trick. But some comets may be porous. They could just absorb whatever we throw at them, like a sponge. In 2005, scientists were ready to test their theories about how a comet would react when it was hit. They were going to try to crush a rocket into one. They called it Deep Impact. They were going to see what happened when a spacecraft slammed violently into a comet at 37,000 kilometers an hour. Deep Impact's primary goal was to peer inside a comet. That inner material has remained relatively unchanged since the solar system was formed and could provide clues about the solar system's beginnings. But astronomers also hoped to gather ideas about how to stop a comet heading towards us. Deep Impact began here at NASA's vertical gun range in Mountain View, California where it was the job of Dr. Peter Schultz and his team to figure out what the comet would do when it was hit. This particular instrument allows us to fire a, a small sphere, about a quarter inch, at speeds that are maybe six or seven times the speed of a rifle bullet. This whole assembly rotates up to an elevation where the gun is basically three stories high. This allows us to send the projectile through different openings in the chamber so that we can impact a flat surface at different angles. Scientists believe comets vary in their makeup. So Schultz and his team built several different models. Then hit each with shot from their ultra high speed gun. The first scenario is what happens if we impact into something that looks like lunar dust. The second one is what happens if we impact into fluff. And the third one is what happens if we impact into a fluff covered with an organic layer. As we go down and look at the evolution of this crater, we find at the very end, after it's finished, we can still see the crater here. But in these two cases, when we're using fluff, we can't see the crater. It's completely masked. The fluff completely absorbed the projectile a frustrating result for scientists hoping to get a look inside. And there was another possibility Schultz had to consider. What if the entire comet is extremely fragile and porous? He searched for a substance for that simulation. The comet may be sort of like a fluff ball. It may have been very low density. What do we do to try to simulate that? The best thing probably is a complex organic. What would that be? Cotton candy. So what we're going to try to do is to concoct a, a, a superficial comet, an imaginary comet, and see if we can't fire into that and see what happens. So what, we're, what we'll end up doing here is to get this very low density, this fibrous material. OK, that looks pretty good. Okay, what we're now going to do is we're going to suspend this in the vacuum chamber, slam into it at a very high velocity, and we're going to find out whether it blows it apart or if the projectile will go straight through. Okay, we're, we're all set. We've got our comet made of cotton candy. Let's turn off the lights and let's get out of here. The projectile soared right through the comet, Can you back her up? but the force shattered it. Oh, is that cool? <laughs> Kapow! <laughs> well, it did drill through it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay, I gotta see this. <laughs> oh my god! There's no more comet, that's for sure. What a mess. But this is not good news. 
A shattered comet can be even more dangerous than an intact one. The pieces tend to remain on the same path, turning one projectile into many. In 2005, once the team had completed their tests, NASA was ready to take the plunge. It would try to drive an impactor into a comet to find out what's inside. Deep Impact's principal investigator is the University of Maryland's Dr. Michael Ahern. So here we have the uh, model of both Deep Impact spacecraft. Many people think it was only one spacecraft, but it's really two. The flyby spacecraft has all the instruments on this platform on one side. And if I turn it around, these are the solar panels that provide the uh, electric power. Here is the impactor. That is a third of a ton geologist's hammer with which you hit something to see how it behaves when you hit it. January the 12th, 2005. After six years of study and preparation, Deep Impact was ready for liftoff. Three, two, one. We have ignition and liftoff of a Delta II rocket carrying Deep Impact. The spacecraft's destination was a comet named Temple One. Discovered in 1867, it's well known to astronomers. It orbits the sun every five and a half years and has lost much of its gas and ice. People would argue that you should preserve the comets for posterity, but doing a violent study on one that is just typical of a whole class seemed to us to be the right choice uh, for science. Deep impact takes just five months to reach Temple One's orbit. On July the 2nd, 2005, it turns and points its cameras at the comet, 300,000 kilometers away. Then, it released its impactor. If all went well, the collision would blow a hole in Temple One, about 180 meters across and five stories deep, about the size of the Roman Colosseum. But it might destroy the comet by breaking it apart. I was more worried that we didn't know enough about the comet and the impactor might go in and just make a meter diameter hole 100 feet deep and then we'd be hard pressed to tell whether we had actually hit or had missed. Back on Earth, hundreds of scientists held their breath. We lost signal and we had to stand there and wait around. So everybody was trying to be, you know, go keep busy and not feel anxious. Hi. But just in time, the signal returned. Yes. Energy went in, bounced back, and drew out all this material from beneath the surface, which was then exposed out in space into sunlight. And so this is scattered sunlight off of all of this debris that was excavated from the interior of Comet Temple 1. The comet and NASA's craft had collided at over 30,000 kilometers an hour. The explosion was equal to nearly five tons of TNT. It vaporized the impactor completely. And it kicked up far more dust than anyone expected. One of the reasons it was so dusty is that the particles were much smaller than we thought. This is a very fluffy body. The amount of dust was a telltale clue to the comet's makeup. Temple One, at least on the surface, contained far less ice than scientists expected. There was no way that there were large blocks of ice anywhere or rock. And that really is helping us formulate how did these comets get put together? How did they break up? This is the first data we've ever had. So in that sense, it's revolutionary. 
Analysis of the dust showed molecules containing carbon, organic material. So it's plausible that comets could have brought such material to Earth early in its history. A return mission is planned to take another look. In 2010, NASA will have redirected the Stardust spacecraft to go back to Temple 1 and look for the crater that we formed to see what happened to the surface and the rest of the comet when we impacted it. Scientists hope to learn much from deep impact, including how to stop a comet from colliding with Earth. Some thought deep impact might knock the comet Temple 1 into a slightly different orbit. But the comet has continued on exactly the same path as before. It was a secondary objective of the deep impact mission to come up with a plan to mitigate an impact if we had to. Did we figure out what it would take to move a comet out of an orbit that was intersecting the Earth? We didn't figure out enough. Despite the inconclusive results, many still consider Deep Impact the best model for stopping a rogue comet. The key will be to send a larger spacecraft and to hit the comet much harder. Let's assume that this is the cometary nucleus. One way of slowing it down and having it miss the Earth in 20 or 30 years' time is to simply run into it. Bam. If that doesn't work, do it again. If that doesn't work, do it again. But some think we'll need a more radical approach. One plan calls for detonating a nuclear warhead near a comet to nudge it onto a different path. A controversial proposal because of the unknown consequences of releasing radiation in space. Others have called for drilling into the nucleus and setting off a blast inside. But as we've seen, this has the danger of turning one deadly projectile into many. The pieces could continue on the same orbit and, like the blast from a shotgun, wreak destruction over a wider area. Some have proposed less violent yet equally intriguing solutions. They suggest putting lasers on the moon, where the Earth's atmosphere would not deflect them. The lasers could bore into a comet and melt its icy glue. We might even hitch a spacecraft to a comet and tow it out of our way. Whatever the solution, all ideas remain on the drawing board. If a comet is on a collision course, we may not be able to do anything. Even if we could tell tomorrow that something is headed our way, we don't necessarily have the means right now to protect ourselves. For one day, we might look to the heavens and find the comet with our number on it, heading our way. March the 23rd, 1989. An asteroid was about to cross Earth's orbit. It arrived just six hours after the blue planet had passed by. This is the equivalent of two aeroplanes missing each other by seconds. Humanity collectively should fear them because they do hit the Earth. But while comets can be emissaries of death, we're learning that, surprisingly, they can also be agents of rebirth. In the turmoil of the early solar system, Millions, if not trillions, of comets and asteroids pelted the primordial Earth. The massive collisions turned matter molten, peeled back the planet's crust, and sparked firestorms that engulfed the globe. Today, if not for the continuous erosion of wind, water and heat, the Earth's surface would look much like the Moon or Mars. But, as scientists are now learning, that bombardment also produced unexpected results. Those icy comets may have brought the water that now swells the Earth's oceans. 
they may also have delivered organic compounds. From that combination of water and organic materials, life slowly evolved. Comets might still be helping support the Earth's living things. Galactic snowballs are regularly drumming Earth's atmosphere, millions of times a year. Some scientists say the ice balls, some as big as houses, disintegrate when they hit the atmosphere. But they leave behind fleeting clouds of water vapor, sustenance for life below. New York University's Dr. Michael Rampino takes the theory one step further. He believes the Earth endures a cosmic assault, like the one that helped form it, every 30 million years. Each barrage heralds a new cycle of death and new life. It's called the Shiva hypothesis, after the Hindu god of destruction and creation. So there was a period when there was a, a real reduction in the forms of life, and that's followed by uh, an explosion of life. Because whatever survives can fill in all the environmental niches that were uh, opened up by the extinctions of the organisms that used to fill those niches. According to the Shiva hypothesis, the cycle will begin again in about 25 million years, when another barrage from above will cause a global catastrophe and mass extinctions. It's a controversial idea. Most scientists don't see solid evidence of periodic, not to mention predictable, bombardments. And no one has been able to explain why such periodic impacts would occur. Now there has been suggestions that these impacts are periodic on the order of uh, 30 million years or so. The evidence is weak. I think the jury is still out on the so-called Shiva hypothesis. One thing is clear. There's much more we need to learn about comets. One experiment that hopes to add new information about their life-giving properties is already underway. A brainchild of the European Space Agency, the Rosetta mission will land a spacecraft on a comet for the first time. We want to see what is actually in the nucleus and on the nucleus, and the only way you can study that is to put a lander down. Rosetta left Earth in 2004. In 2014, it will rendezvous with comet churyumov gerasimenko As it follows the comet towards the sun, it will send a mini laboratory to its surface. The lander will drill into the nucleus and extract samples. Then it will analyze them. We didn't bring the sample back to the Earth, to the laboratory. We bring the laboratory to the comet and study it there. Rosetta will be a big step toward learning whether comets could have jump-started life on Earth billions of years ago. In future missions, astronomers hope to probe even deeper beneath the surface of comets. The goal remains to increase our understanding of their makeup and their origins, as well as to strengthen our knowledge of how to stop one. But the next time a comet blazes across the sky, we can look at it in a whole new light not simply as a harbinger of death, but as a potent instrument in the evolution of life.
out traffic this morning along the Kiwi Gardener, Guy Valentine. Well, it's a bit of a battle for drivers without cover. I'm talking if you don't have any shade because you're fighting some pretty bright sunshine. And also caution on Highway 7 going east of the northbound Don Valley Parkway on the ramp to eastbound 401. We've got a disabled vehicle. June the 14th, 2002. It was just another busy work day with all the usual hustle and congestion. With all the close calls and near misses that people all over the world have come to accept as the normal level of risk in everyday life. But on that day, high overhead and behind the sun, what no one saw coming what no telescope on Earth was able to see against the blinding light was an asteroid big enough to destroy an entire city. From behind the sun, asteroid 2002 MN came hurtling towards Earth faster than a speeding bullet. It shot past less than a third the distance to the moon and nobody saw it until three days later when the rock emerged from Earth's shadow into the night sky going away. It looks like the Earth just dodged a bullet. Actually, it was an asteroid. Scientists say it blew by last week at a distance they describe as a close shave. The airline industry would call this a near miss. Scientists who study asteroids and comets called it a problem. The threat of asteroid impacts on the Earth is very real. We know that throughout history this has happened. The craters we see on the moon are examples of the kind of impact history that the Earth has had. But it also happens very rarely. So it's a very unusual kind of hazard. It's a hazard in which the risk in any one year is very low, but it does happen, and if it really did come about on our watch, it could end civilization. These cosmic bullets originate on the far side of Mars, in the main asteroid belt, where a bracelet of celestial debris circles the sun. Millions of rocky fragments, building blocks of a planet that never quite came together when the solar system was formed. What's often depicted as a busy cosmic junkyard is actually more like a big empty speedway. The rocks are far apart and moving very fast ranging in size from pebbles to boulders to rocks the size of Mount Everest. Occasionally, the tug of Jupiter's enormous gravity drags an asteroid off course, causing it to crash into another asteroid. Some veer away into new orbits that cross the paths of Mars, Earth, Venus or Mercury. Another ring of debris called the Oort Cloud is the source of most comets, which are big, rocky ice balls that orbit the Sun and cross the paths of the inner planets. All the inner planets and our Moon bear the scars of numerous asteroid and comet impacts. We do get hit all the time by pieces of debris from asteroids and comets. In fact, 40,000 tons of cosmic debris plummets into the atmosphere every year. We see them every night as shooting stars. They don't hit the Earth very often, but when they do, clearly it isn't just going to be a matter of a shooting star seen in the sky. So it is inevitable. It's only a matter of time before the next big one hits us. Even small rocks can make a big impression. In 1908, about 2,000 square kilometers of Siberian forest were instantly flattened as an asteroid exploded near the Tonguska River. The impact site was so remote, researchers had to mount a wilderness expedition just to find the place. When they arrived, there was no crater. Paintings, based on eyewitness accounts, described a fireball. A horrendous explosion in the sky didn't actually come crashing down to the ground. It exploded uh, maybe uh, five to ten kilometers up in the atmosphere. Uh, and that made a big blast wave in the atmosphere. And, and that is what did the damage. 
All this was caused by a relatively small asteroid, somewhere between 50 and 100 meters across. Roughly the same size as asteroid 2002 MN, the one we couldn't see coming. Tunguska's 2,000 square kilometer blast wave would have leveled London. But as bleak as the thought of cosmic collision may be, there is at least a glimmer of hope. One of the special things about the asteroid impact problem is that unlike the weather or earthquakes or other natural hazards, we, at least in principle, we could do something about it. And when we know one's coming for us, our claim is that the technology is available today to stop it. On the Earth, we've got active geology, we've got volcanoes, we've got earthquakes, we've got continental drift, we've got rain, we've got wind, we've got storms, we've got snow. All of those things are road away craters, and that, in some ways, actually fools us into thinking that, indeed, the Earth doesn't get hit as often as it actually does. Counting craters on the Moon and then estimating how often the Earth gets hit can be a pretty sobering exercise. One scientist who made that kind of calculation was astronomer Ernst Opik, who published his impact estimate back in 1951. The general public, however, paid little attention to the science or the implications. But one individual who did take the issue to heart was Lembit Opik, the astronomer's grandson, who got himself elected to parliament. My grandfather is the reason why I carried on in politics, what he initiated in science. In essence, uh, he was a pioneer. He saw the danger of asteroid and cometary impacts with the Earth, and he had the courage to speak up about them. And he did that at a time when it wasn't really taken seriously, in the 1950s and 1960s. After years of pushing and prodding, Lembit Opik convinced the British government to commission a comprehensive scientific study of the asteroid and comet threat. The expert conclusion was, the threat is indeed real. Now, the government has set up a task force to examine the risk of an asteroid hitting the Earth. Still, sceptical politicians might want to get on the bus and take a trip to the Natural History Museum. Ask any schoolchild who's been there recently and you'll hear a fascinating and truly scary tale about what happened to the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs were alive here. They were dead when the sediment was deposited. And this layer is one of the most unique layers in Earth history. In 1980, the discovery of iridium beside a layer of clay which marked the end of the age of dinosaurs led Lewis and Walter Alvarez to publish a theory that a huge asteroid or comet had hit the Earth 65 million years ago and wiped out the dinosaurs. But for this concept to be confirmed, there had to be a crater. There may be tons of dinosaur bones in these dry canyons, but where on Earth was the big crater? just the kind of mystery a budding young scientist would love to solve. When I went back to... Off the coast of Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, Dr. Alan Hildebrand investigated a huge gravity anomaly discovered by oil drillers back in the 1950s. Put that together with a semicircular magnetic anomaly and you get a massive crater, 180 kilometers across, near a little village called Chicxulub Pueblo. Most of the crater is underwater now. Erosion and continental drift have covered the visible evidence. But 65 million years ago, this was ground zero. This object would have fallen through the atmosphere in just a few seconds. If it was going through the sky, it would have been brighter than the sun. As soon as it contacts the surface of the shallow sea and Chipshalub, of course, it starts propagating the shock wave down into the planet and it keeps pushing into the planet and it only gets stopped maybe about 30 kilometers down. The pressure wave would have traveled around the entire planet in the atmosphere. You could have heard the impact on the other side of the planet. The giant impact fireball rising out of the hole, it would have risen say 10,000 kilometers above 
the surface of the planet. Near the impact site, it would have been so hot, it would have evaporated the clouds and been hot enough to make the forest, even a green forest, uh, begin to burn. For Alan Hildebrand, finding that crater pretty much clinched the argument. Planet Earth had been all but sterilized by a rock the size of Mount Everest. Three quarters of the species of large uh, animal life went extinct. We have made the case. We've got the qualitative information and we've got the statistics to show that there is a very serious risk. If you wanted to save planet Earth from cosmic disaster, where would you find people with all the right stuff to do the job? Well, Houston, Texas might be a good place to start looking. This town has that rarest of breeds, the space cowboy. Houston is home to NASA's Johnson Space Center, where rocket science is a way of life and astronauts learn their trade. If you can roll me 90 and then go down, I'll come in on my side. Behind a swimming pool big enough to swallow an apartment block, you'll find a small research lab where the rocket engine of the future is being built and bench tested. Yeah, mm -hmm. very nice. The question is how big is the plasma going to go from here to here? Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz is one of the lead researchers, as well as an astronaut with seven shuttle missions under his belt. And in fact, there was a time uh, in one of my flights where we got hit by very tiny uh, micro meteorites, perhaps, or, or some sort of orbital debris, um, which made little tiny dents or little craters in the windows of the shuttle. First-hand experience with rocks in space gave birth to a new idea and a dual purpose to Chang Diaz's work here. His rocket engine has been developed for long-distance missions to Mars or as far away as the icy moons of Jupiter. But it could also be used to push a dangerous asteroid out of harm's way. I am concerned enough to think that we need to uh, not waste time arguing about it uh, as to whether it's real or not. I think we, move, we need to move ahead and uh, do them. Well, I'm wild and the hell's free. Come on, baby, you belong to me. You swing, kiss, and it's my passion. Stop. Well, I'm wild and I am free. Come on, baby, you belong to me. Sweet kiss makes my engine start. The way you move, you own my heart. Sweet kiss makes my engine start. The way you move, you own my heart. If, if this is a... Uh... A, a threat which has a very low probability, all it takes is one, and we are history. But before we can send a spacecraft chasing after a rogue asteroid, we have to know where to look for it. In the American West, if you drive across the desert to the White Sands Missile Range in southern New Mexico, you'll find the most powerful and effective asteroid hunter on Earth. Scientists here have tested everything from rockets to the very first atomic bomb. Today, across the valley floor from the Trinity bomb site, the US Air Force has installed one of the world's most advanced telescopes. This state-of-the-art technology was developed by MIT's Lincoln Laboratory as part of the Star Wars anti-missile defense system. These may not be the world's biggest telescopes, 
but they clearly are the best when it comes to finding deadly rocks in space. This is Linear, the Lincoln Near-Earth Asteroid Research Facility. On a given night when we scan the sky with this, we'll find perhaps uh, 10 to 12,000 moving objects in the sky. Now most of those are main belt asteroids and as such don't represent uh, any danger to Earth. But on the other hand, something like half of those will be brand new discoveries and buried in there will be one or two near Earth objects. Because the Earth rotates, the sky is always moving overhead. To get a clear picture of an asteroid, you have to make the sky stop moving. And you do that with a telescope that can track or follow the stars. This way, you can take time-lapse pictures that isolate the blur of fast-moving asteroids against a crystal-clear sky. It then records these pictures like a TV camera on a computer chip that has 20 times more detail than the picture you're now watching. The linear computer deletes previously known stars and planets, leaving a less cluttered time-lapse sequence of the new discoveries. At the end of each night shift, Linear's thousands of new discoveries are emailed to the International Astronomical Union's Minor Planet Center at Harvard University. A team of only three scientists must cope with the avalanche of new sightings, searching for potentially hazardous asteroids or comets. Computers make a rough calculation of an asteroid's orbit, but it's up to Brian Marsden to estimate the level of risk. They may be reporting 50 or 60,000 observations from one night, uh, and it takes a while to, uh, to, to get through that. But so we, we look first at the fast movers uh, and see if there's anything interesting there. H is equal to sine delta. We do sometimes get close to um, 70 or 80,000 observations a day, almost, almost one per second. There are some days when we effectively have one observation per second. Even with fast computers, Marsden's team can make only a preliminary calculation of each asteroid's orbit. Five shots in one night cover only a tiny segment of an asteroid's orbital path. You can't solve for the orbit completely from that, uh, but the fact that you're seeing motion uh, over a, a half an hour or an hour, something like that, does allow us to get a partial solution uh, for the orbit. Refining the orbit gets complicated. When 2002 MN shot past, its trajectory was warped by Earth gravity and scientists at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California had to add that to their calculations. Here's an animation I put together of the asteroid last year which was discovered after it passed by the Earth. An elite team of mathematicians and celestial mechanics is now working full-time on a computerized warning system. Our, our orbit animation, you can see how when it returns out to the asteroid belt, the close approach to the Earth has changed its orbit and it's no longer returning to the same place it started. Because 2002 MN will circle around the Sun and come past us again, the NASA orbital mechanics team will have to adjust the calculation in order to know whether it will ever pose a danger to Earth at some point in the future. So here we've zoomed in on the Earth-Moon system and we're looking down. You can see how close it came to the Earth that went over the top yeah. and how you can actually even see the bend in the trajectory. So it's a great example of how um, a close approach to the Earth, or in fact any planet, can be used to, or can change, significantly change in orbit. To know where an asteroid is likely to be in the future, you need a model of the solar system. Mechanical models that show the relative motions of the Sun and planets have been around since the early 18th century. They're called orreries. What the celestial mechanics at NASA had to do 
was create a new digital model. One that includes the gravitational attractions of all the planets and the sun. And all the other forces that can affect where an asteroid might go. You just compute what forces are acting on this particular asteroid from all the planets and, and many of the minor planets in the solar system and then uh, we can actually trace the motion of that object around the solar system uh, for hundreds of years. For scientists, the acid test of their mathematics came when a strange new comet raced toward Jupiter. A stream of cosmic bullets that would shock and amaze millions here on Earth. In the spring of 1993, the eyes of the world turned almost in unison towards a doomsday rock like no other. From the far side of the solar system, it flew in a death spiral toward the largest planet. Jean Schumacher, his wife Carolyn and their colleague David Levy had discovered an odd-looking streak of light that turned out to be a fractured comet. 21 large chunks of icy rock and cosmic dust heading towards Jupiter. We knew we had something very unusual. It was so unusual we were a little unsure just what we were dealing with. NASA asked Paul Chodas and his team to calculate the orbit and predict whether this new comet would actually hit Jupiter. And it started off at some 60% and before long it was 90% and this was a year before impacts. As the impacts approached, we continued to predict not just the Im impact probability, which went very high, but where and when the comet fragments would hit the planet. And uh, it was a prediction months in advance, uh, and as we got closer and closer to the uh, impacts, I kept wondering, well, is, are the ma is the math right? Are, uh, will this actually happen the way it uh, was uh, predicted? A giant comet is on a collision course with Jupiter. Everybody on Earth who was paying any attention wanted to see if the comet would actually hit Jupiter. We have liftoff, liftoff of the Space Shuttle Endeavour on an ambitious mission to service the Hubble Space Telescope. NASA's Hubble Space Telescope set its sights on the planet, and the pictures of what happened next were truly stunning. Then the impacts occurred. We were uh, within minutes of getting the right uh, answer on the time of impact, and the location of impact turned out to be just right. Over the next week, 20 more fragments of the comet crashed into Jupiter, some leaving scars as large as the Earth. Bang on its cosmic schedule, the comet's first impact was recorded by NASA within the last hour. When fragment G slammed into Jupiter, releasing an amount of energy equivalent to about 6 million megatons of TNT. In the wake of SL9, a group of concerned scientists gathered in Italy for a brainstorming session. Hello! They created a brand new international organization called the Space Guard Foundation okay, I'm going to, join. to promote the discovery and study of near-Earth objects. Some people imagine that there are lots of astronomers out there scanning the sky looking for incoming comets and asteroids, and, and that of course is not true. In fact, until recently, there was hardly anyone out there looking. It's going to glow for about a half an hour and set everything on fire around you. But whose job is it to defend planet Earth? Weapon scientists from the United States and Russia had already held a series of meetings and came up with their own ideas about how to deal with the impact threat. The military establishment under Star Wars had uh, created a whole lot of devices or at least concepts for weapons in space and devices in space. And in the early 90s, uh, when the Star Wars program was looking a little bit iffy, I think there was some motivation for them to 
try to apply their technology to this newly discovered uh, hazard from asteroids and comets. The military approach to the problem proved to be controversial. The notion of sending nuclear weapons into space generated an immediate backlash. Edward Teller was proposing that we blow up an asteroid to show that we could protect and protect the Earth. And I, I thought that was a pretty crazy idea. Blowing up an asteroid with a big bomb uh, has a lot of problems associated with it, violating treaties, uh, taking a single asteroid and making a swarm of uh, smaller asteroids. Uh, it seemed like it was more uh, interest in bombs than it was a serious interest in, in defending the planet. For NASA, on the other hand, uh, NASA obviously is the natural agency to discover the threat and the objects, but they say, no, planetary defense, that's, that's a military obligation and, and not an obligation of NASA. Not NASA, not the military. Just when it seemed planetary defense was nobody's job, a tiny speck in the sky would set off doomsday alarms around the world. On a winter's night, the 6th of December 1997, a dim streak of light moving through the constellation Cancer was captured by a telescope in the Arizona desert. Big enough to destroy civilization as we know it, asteroid 1997 XF11 seemed to be heading towards Earth. The initial sighting by the Kitt Peak Observatory in Tucson, Arizona was relayed to the Minor Planet Center at Harvard University in Cambridge, where a computer made the first rough calculation of the orbit. They were pretty sure it would miss the Earth on this pass, but it would be coming round again, and it looked like there could be a problem in 30 years. There were indications of close approach to the Earth in 2028, that was about 45,000 kilometers, which really was rather, rather, rather close. With only a handful of sightings, the orbit calculation remained very rough. It was hard to tell where this rock was going. So Brian Marsden posted a bulletin asking astronomers around the world for more observations before the rock became too faint to see. I was saying, hey, uh, get your big telescopes onto this. On the one hand, we're only going to be able to observe it for another month or so. We want to improve the orbit calculation and find out exactly how close it is coming. But one line in the bulletin said that the chance of a collision was small, but it was not entirely out of the question. Within hours of the website posting, reporters discovered XF-11 and doomsday headlines screamed around the world. Because the close approach in 2028 would put the asteroid nearest to Europe, London newspapers focused on the exact moment life on Earth might possibly end. Pictures of it on the internet show it as a tiny moving blob. Scientists have calculated its path in the year 2028. Watch very carefully September, October, October the 28th, the two coalesce. But at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California, the orbital dynamics team thought there must be some mistake. To my great surprise, when we, uh, we ran our software, it said that the probability of impact of this uh, particular asteroid in 30 years was uh, essentially zero. As it turned out, the end of the world asteroid would miss the Earth. That big rock in space posed no threat after all. A frantic hunt through the archives at NASA had turned up photographs of XF-11 taken eight years earlier. And as soon as those were placed into the orbit determination process, they confirmed the fact that there was no chance that it could hit the Earth in 30 years. The public at large was not understanding uncertainty uh, in, in this. They wanted uh, you know, an immediate answer. Is it going to hit us or not? But people were paying attention. One side effect of the false alarm was that public and political awareness of the threat had been raised. Two months after XF-11, New hearings were held in Washington and NASA was told to speed up the science of asteroid detection. Finally, it seemed, there was a political will to do something.
Congress gave NASA a 10-year deadline to search the skies and get a fix on the largest of the doomsday rocks. They called it the Space Guard Survey. While astronomers geared up to search the skies, Hollywood was going into overdrive. I would go to every dinner party and I would say, are you aware what would happen if a comet was actually on a collision course with the Earth? Oscar-winning screenwriter Bruce Joel Rubin was hard at work on the remake of a sci-fi classic. The new film called Deep Impact would be a Steven Spielberg production. When we arrived at a hotel in New York, the porter was so incredibly careful, careless with our bags. And the room they gave us, it was beautiful. A broom closet. But the best part, worst part was the shower. My, My wife drying herself with the Egyptian cotton towel shower curtain to find that whole vacation, whole vacation for, her. for her. Don't just visit New York. Visit TripAdvisor New York. With millions of reviews, a visit to TripAdvisor makes any destination better. The army of scientists work desperately to build this giant rocket, this modern Noah's Ark, to carry a few picked survivors of our doomed civilization. I think the thing that was hardest for me was the realization that people would have to be chosen to survive. Let's take the ship away from them! Come on! Probably a very, very small percentage of human beings would be left on the Earth able to survive something of the intensity of the, the comet that hit and destroyed the dinosaurs. So I felt making this movie is not just a mission to tell a good story, it's to change minds. It's to let people go, this is something real. This can happen to us. This movie is a wake-up call. It's not just a Hollywood movie, it is pointing at you. As Hollywood released Deep Impact, telling the world in no uncertain terms that cosmic collisions were no longer just a cosmic joke, real-life professional asteroid hunters were making movies of their own. But instead of using cameras, they worked with delayed Doppler radar. Take the same technology behind a police radar system, jump the power to 400,000 watts, and you've got NASA's Deep Space Network with huge multi-dish systems like the Goldstone Tracking Station in California's Mojave Desert. This is the, the main room of the pedestal of DSS-14. The first time radar astronomer Stephen Ostro bounced a signal off a rock in space, a wobbling blot of pixelated data bounced back. What looks like digital gibberish spoke volumes to Steve Ostro. Radar really does, it does three things at once. One, it works at long wavelengths, so you're sensitive to structure on large scales and metal concentration. The other is you can make pictures. And you can't do this from the ground in any other way. You make pictures of objects, and then we take a sequence of pictures, and we go through a computational process to produce the 3D models. That's the second thing. The third thing is that it makes very precise measurements of distance and speed. When the 1,000-foot radar dish at Arecibo in Puerto Rico bounced a beam off an asteroid called Castalia, the data was translated into a 3D computer model. The very first radar movie showed how Castalia spins and revealed that it was actually two massive chunks of rock held together by weak gravity. Every time they made the trip to Goldstone for a new radar target, Ostro and his team were like kids reaching into a box of chocolates. They never really knew just what they would find. Asteroid Cleopatra, shaped like a dog bone, was roughly the same size as the state of New Jersey and was made almost entirely of metal. Echoes from asteroid Tutatis produced images of a rocky, cratered surface and a wobbling, tumbling spin. Uh, every single one of these objects that we've made a shape model of is very different. This is Tutatis. From a telescopic smudge of light, to a 3D-shaped model, radar gave them physical details and the first clear idea of what asteroids are really like. 
In the year 2000, the radar movie crew developed a dark and mysterious new image, asteroid 1950 DA, a big rock that gave everybody a bit of a shock. Once we got the radar data, we began the normal process of just seeing how far in the future we could predict this thing before the uncertainties in the orbit blur out. And in this case, we could go over uh, 880 years into the future. And what was startling about that case was uh, the impact probability turned out to be non-zero. Non-zero means there is a chance this rock could hit us. On March the 16th, in the year 2880, 1950 DA will cross the Earth's orbit. Will it hit us? The odds? 1 in 300. If 1950 DA does hit the Earth, the most likely point of impact would be at sea. Of all the big asteroids discovered thus far, this is the most dangerous one we know. Eric Asfaug and Stephen Ward have created a computer model of the impact. Yeah, it's kind of funny how this started. Uh, it was with that, the movie Deep Impact, and uh, I was getting phone calls. Lots of people were getting phone calls about the movie, whether it was accurate, the, the big cresting tsunami coming across. The concept here is that uh, this asteroid, which is about a kilometer across, will hit the ocean at 17,000 miles per hour, and it'll blow a hole in the ocean about 19 kilometers across and all the way to the bottom. And so when this huge hole of water gets blown in, into the ocean, the water will run back in again, and it overshoots and it collapses and overshoots many, many times, and each time it pumps out a wave. So it starts out hundreds of meters high, comes ashore on the coast of North America at about 50, 60 meters, up toward Canada, Grand Banks, it's about 40 meters, 20 meters here in the coast of South America, and about 15, 20 meters all the way over to Europe. These waves would run inland about four kilometers, so pretty much everything within four kilometers from the beach would be covered up repeatedly. And so we'd pretty much be wiped away like, there's, like a, you're scrubbing the floor, you know, you scrub <laughs> like this and it's pretty much be all be carried back out. In February 2001, a NASA spacecraft called Near Schumacher made the first ever landing on a chunky pockmarked rock named after the Greek god of love. Asteroid 433 Eros is 33 kilometers long and 13 kilometers wide, one of the largest near-Earth asteroids. The pictures were spectacular. The data will take years to process. Proving that they could land on an asteroid was a major achievement, but in the end, they still don't know much about what's inside. How dense, how tough, how brittle or crumbly is it? What would happen if they gave it a good shove? The surface appearance of any dark and mysterious object can be very deceiving. So these two spheres, as far as I can tell, have exactly the same mass, the same compressibility, uh, the same color. If I were a spacecraft orbiting these, and these were asteroids, I'd be very hard pressed to tell which was which. Yet, if I dropped them from a height, one of them bounces. Really il illustrates the fact that one of these responds elastically and one of these responds like a lump of clay. And it's critical to really go and find out what's inside before we even start thinking about moving these things around. When a 3D model of the asteroid Castellia got smacked in a computer simulation, a problem occurred. An impact with the same energy as the Hiroshima bomb turned Castellier into a pile of rubble, but did not deflect its trajectory in any significant way. But there are other ways to apply force to deflecting an incoming asteroid. Using the power of the sun to push dangerous rocks out of the way may not be so far-fetched after all. This is a typical near-Earth asteroid. Its uh, name is Golevka. It's about half a kilometer across. It's a hazardous asteroid. Its uh, most likely fate is going to be to strike the Earth someday, uh, thousands of years from now. Modern-day researchers like Eric Asfaug say the idea of a giant orbital magnifying glass to burn space rocks could work. You create a vapor plume in one direction, and that starts the asteroid moving in the other. 
It's a very gradual process. It's not going to happen instantaneously. You need to know where this guy is 100 years or 50 years ahead of time. But if you do, you've got all the time in the world for a satellite to sit there, no human intervention whatsoever, and it'll gradually shove the asteroid into a different orbit and it'll miss the Earth. Some of the technology to do this already exists. Take an inflatable parabolic antenna the size of a tennis court, convert it to a solar collector, and use it to focus sunlight on an asteroid. The Russians have built and are testing a giant sail that captures the minute pressure of sunlight. Just attach the sail to an asteroid and let the rock hitch a ride to someplace else. But using the sun to save the Earth means waiting for nature to do the work. If we don't see an asteroid until the last minute, solar power would be too little, too late. A nuclear electric plasma engine could push an asteroid out of harm's way. The rocket technology at this NASA lab in Houston, Texas, could provide the power for a space tugboat. A group of astronauts and aerospace engineers is designing the B612 mission to prove that asteroid deflection can be done with existing technology. Uh, these are rockets that uh, have very tiny amounts of thrust, but um, they are so frugal in the use of propellant that we can keep the rocket going for periods of the orders of a year. Building a better rocket engine is only the first step. Figuring out how to latch on to an asteroid, point it in the right direction, and push without losing control is the really tricky part. After years of research, NASA finally had it, the first complete draft of a plan, a demonstration mission, to save the planet. off the impact with the Earth 10 years later so that it misses the Earth and not just miss it randomly but miss it very precisely so that we don't simply pass on the problem to our grandchildren. <laughs> Midway through 2003, the Space Guard survey had reached the halfway point. A little more than half of the kilometer-sized near-Earth asteroids had been located, and the news was mostly good. For the 60% that we have already found, I can tell you that there is not a single one that poses a danger. For the 40% that we have not yet found, I can tell you nothing. One could hit tomorrow. Not very likely, but until we found them and catalog them, we won't know. But finding the really big asteroids, those one kilometer monster rocks capable of ending human civilization, is only the first part of the challenge. There are an estimated 50,000 smaller asteroids that are big enough to cause tidal waves or destroy vast regions of the Earth. A 200 meter asteroid happens maybe once every 10,000 years, but that's like 600 megatons to 800 megatons exploding in one place. Recall the small 60 meter rock that exploded over Siberia in 1908? Well, even though it could have destroyed a city like London or New York, rocks that small are not included in the current Space Guard survey meaning no one is officially looking for them. Which, of course, is the same thing as saying that chances are enormous that a Tunguska-sized object will find us before we even see it coming. 
as happened in, in 1908. That is, that is likely to happen nowadays, that, that we won't see it coming. There has been talk of expanding the search to include smaller asteroids. It'll take more and bigger telescopes and, of course, more money. But until we do, we'll have no idea where those city killer rocks are. Evolution on Earth has proceeded in part because every so often a global catastrophe comes along, pushes the reset button, and new things happen. It wiped out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, and at the time, we mammals were just furry little creatures burrowing around in the ground, and, and uh, an asteroid or a comet impact took out our principal competition. I guess we are saying implicitly, if not explicitly, that we want to do away with that natural cycle. We've had enough evolution. <laughs> we like ourselves on the top of the ladder. And we can do something which will change cosmic evolution from this point forward in terms of life on Earth. Dinosaurs ruled the Earth until a big rock wiped them out. The question is, will another rock do the same to humanity? Let's get a couple good pictures here. Humans are the first species with the potential to block a doomsday rock and switch off the evolutionary reset button. People very often say, look, you're just a doomsayer. You think that these awful things are going to happen. I'm not that way at all. I'm entirely optimistic. The way in which I view asteroid, asteroids and comets and the possibility of them hitting the Earth is that it's a great challenge. Thank goodness we've realized the hazard and the danger before the next one happens. It's given us time, we hope, to do something about it. Scientists can study the sky and find the dangerous rocks ahead of time. Astronomers can do the math and predict the orbits. People have the desire and the right stuff to do the job. There's a whole new field of science that could give humanity an option the dinosaurs never had.